Uh, we welcome everyone um, here this morning. Let's take the roll. Lou? Uh, here. Lou here. Runner? Here. Runner here. Block? Hancock? Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Here. Monning here. Penn? Here. Penn here. Vidak? Here. Vidak here. And I want to take a moment to um, welcome our new vice chair, uh, Senator Sharon Runner, who is replacing um, a longtime friend to education, Senator Bob Huff, and um, Senator Bill Monning, who is also joining us um, on the committee. So we have a, a full complement of nine members. So um, welcome, everyone. So the first uh, item on the agenda, we have 17 items today. Um, one item is for vote only. We have five bills on consent, and uh, the rest are going to be heard in uh, sign-in order. So with consistent, um, the first order of business is uh, item one, uh, SB 277, for vote only. And uh, consistent with my announcement during the hearing last week, SB 277 will uh, be vote only. There will be no public testimony. And the authors will present the proposed amendments today. Members have been provided with an RN and a mock-up. Uh, members may pose questions uh, specific to the proposed amendments to the authors. If members have questions that require clarification from anyone other than the authors, members may request through the chair that individuals other than the authors respond to that specific question. And this committee may agree upon the amendments and condition their votes upon the amendments. But due to timing issues, the amendments will be formally adopted uh, in the next committee by the Senate Judiciary Committee. Okay, so there's no uh, adoption today. So we'll just see if, the, um, if there's a consistent vote to get the bill out. So with that, um, Senator Pan and Senator Allen, uh, SB 277, please. Well, Madam Chair and Senators, also staff of the members, and uh, let me just... First of all, thank you so much for all of your work. Uh, while the amendments we are presenting are basically one sentence, they are two amendments and they reflect uh, quite a bit of time. Everyone in this room helped to, to craft this legislation. Uh, something, you know, all, all this time and consideration is something that I certainly very much appreciate. Uh, some of you heard yesterday from a mother, Nina, whose son cannot be vaccinated. She's returned to my, my district, but her story was for her search for a public school with a high immunization rate that her son could attend. Her story is not hers alone, uh, nor are the stories that many of you have told in this room. All these stories and these lives, along with the ones that we don't hear, are the reason why we're all here today. Now, Senator Pan and I present amendments today that we think strikes a balance for allowing folks like Nina to find a school for her son and for those who firmly do not want to vaccinate their children. Uh, while this is a balance with these two factions, it's also a balance for the authors who both deeply believe that everyone should vaccinate a child who doesn't have a medical concern because it makes it safer for them and for all of us. While this bill won't reach everyone, it will increase everyone's safety against vaccine preventable diseases. So the amendments will clarify homeschoolers will be exempt from SB 277. Specifically, it will clarify that homeschoolers who register as a private school can meet with other homeschoolers. Second, it will state that parents whose children learn at home and are enrolled through a district's independent study program will also be exempt. In other words, the bill's language will now read, quote, this subdivision does not apply to a pupil in a home-based private school or a pupil who is enrolled in an independent study program pursuant to Article 5.5, commencing with Section 51745 of Chapter 5 of Part 28 of the Education Code. And for those who would like, uh, those with a mock-up draft of this amendment, this is on page 4, line 18. Uh, for those out there who are reviewing the legislation, this sentence appears at the end of the Health and Safety Code, Section uh, 120335, and will be in print later this week, as mentioned by the chair, as we go, uh, if this is, goes past the committee and, and we're able to move to the Judiciary Committee. So uh, we think we've struck a, a fair balance here that uh, provides more options to parents who are concerned about uh, not vaccinating their children, and we appreciate all the time and effort that's gone into this and uh, appreciate the opportunity to take some questions. Thank you. Are there questions from members? Leva. Good morning, Senators. Uh, I just want to thank both of you for your work and your help. Um, as I stated last week, I firmly believe in vaccines. My children have been vaccinated when they were young. They are grown now. 
uh, and I appreciate your work on the, the independent study and the whole uh, the homeschooling exemption. Uh, and I know that you both are very passionate about this issue, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, however, I am very passionate about workers and working families, and I just still have a concern that this will not go far enough to help a two-income family who cannot homeschool their child or a single working parent. So I just want to thank you for your help and uh, the fact that we, you were willing to take amendments, but I will respectfully be voting no. Um, Senator Monning. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I also just want to thank the authors and the chair and your staff for working to strike a balance. And uh, clearly in, in our efforts to find balance, um, there's going to be people who feel it doesn't go far enough one way or the other. Um, I'm one of those who feel strongly that the public health interest of all Californians is our charge. Uh, and as I said in an earlier hearing, striking the balance between individual choice about your own child, uh, if that choice can affect the health of somebody else's child, uh, then it goes beyond the purview of personal choice and becomes a personal choice with community consequences. Uh, and because of that, um, I appreciate your work to try to expand options for those who choose not to vaccinate um, to pursue the education of their children. Uh, and I see that this version that we're looking at also maintains and protects the medical exemption. And we know some families who through no choice related to vaccines or not have children with immune compromised conditions uh, families dealing with a child struggling with leukemia or other, uh, other immune compromising diseases, part of our responsibility is to make sure there are public schools where their children can attend uh, without the risk of being exposed or infected by diseases for which we do have vaccines <laughs> that have been proven safe and efficacious. So with the medical exemption preserved, uh, for those families and the expansion in these amendments, uh, I just appreciate it. I want to hear the further dialogue, but uh, again, want to thank the chair and your staff for your leadership on this as well. Thank you. Senator Block. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, last week uh, when we heard this bill, I raised two concerns. One, how great is the harm? Because we're, we're doing some pretty... Uh, draconian things here in terms of cutting options for, for parents to educate their kids. So I need to be convinced that there is significant harm done if we don't um, pass this bill. And, and Dr. Pan during the week presented me with some modeling information. And would you, Dr. Pan, just relate again, what was the organization that, that, that conducted the studies, the modeling? So the uh, modeling was done by a, a group of uh, researchers at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's based on uh, data uh, from uh, they have the School of Public Health, and so uh, they did they do modeling actually on other contagions. So they've uh, created this modeling to look at what would happen if you had low immunization rates for for measles. But they're an expert group that does modeling for a variety of different contagions, uh, some not related to, uh, to vaccination. Okay, and as I recall, the modeling data showed that. Um, with this bill, with the increased vaccination rate, for example, one case in San Diego would probably not result in very many more cases. But without this bill, with the trends we're seeing in exemptions, um, it would result in really an epidemic of measles in San Diego, for example. Is that correct? Uh, if our, uh, basically, what hap yes, the, of what happens is that when, if our immunity continues to decline, we will see larger outbreaks. And I think you saw that. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we, you'd see many more people uh, get not only exposed but infected. And in fact, we saw a taste of that in real life with the uh, outbreak in Disneyland. But the modeling certainly shows if the immunization rate had, for example, fallen to 80 percent for all children, essentially you could, you could see that that just spreads throughout the whole county. It doesn't, uh, that you would not be unable to contain the infection and that many people would be, I mean, you saw a huge number, you know, number of people were exposed. 
And again, as I admitted last week, I'm no expert in this, so I'm depending on you. I'm depending on University of Pittsburgh Medical School. Well, and, and that's so. supported by every uh, mainstream scientific medical and public health uh, expert and uh, organization in, in, in the country. So, so, so then if we assume, and I appreciate your following up with me and, and with my staff on this, if we assume then that there is indeed significant harm um, that the citizens of California would incur if we don't pass this bill, then the question, the second question I had was, how do we have less restrictive options for schooling for parents who choose not to vaccinate? Because that is their right to make that choice, even if I personally might disagree with it. And, and I appreciate, again, that you, your, you authors have expanded school options. I would hope there is even greater expansion, but, but in recognition that you have expanded pretty, pretty significantly the options and, and that you did answer the questions I asked, um, and understanding that as this bill moves along, they're probably going to be, during the course of Senate and Assembly, um, six or seven or eight more committees you'll be going to with this bill, and there will continue to be modifications, I would anticipate. Um, I'm going to vote to let this bill continue, um, and, and hopefully we'll continue to see progress that expands educational opportunities while still containing the dangers. So, uh, so I, I appreciate your responsiveness, both of you, in, in the amendments that you presented today. And Senator, I, I welcome, I think both of us welcome a conversation with you about, about additional uh, flexibility. I, I, we're, 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 we, we, we share the same concerns. I and mean, you know, I, I'm a, a former, I'm an educator myself, and we want to figure out a way to make sure this works for, for all of our families. Thank you. Senator Mendoza. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, First of all, I want to commend the authors for working so hard on this piece of legislation. Uh, as a former school teacher, uh, we deal with a lot of challenges day in and day out. We're always concerned for the safety of our kids, uh, making sure that all their needs are being met in the classroom, whether it be uh, some kids have special needs, some kids have, might have vision problems, we have to sit them in the front, we have to make sure the door, we have access to the door in case of an emergency, make sure it's clean, everything. We don't need to be worried about whether there's going to be an outbreak of some sort or that every kid is going to be fully immunized or not. Uh, I do think that this, is a, this measure is very necessary to make our profession just a little bit easier on teachers who go to work day in and day out to do the best for their students. Uh, so as a former school teacher, I appreciate uh, what you've done and what you can, will continue to do. And with that, Madam Chair, I would like to move the bill. Thank you. The bill has been moved. Um, Senator Runner or Senator Hancock, you have comments or questions? Actually, uh, I listened to the testimony last week, and so I'm kind of up to date on what's happened. Uh, watching it on the TV is a lot different than being here and seeing uh, all the people that are here. I think uh, with the amendments, it makes it better. Um, I'm not sure it makes it better enough for me to vote on it. So um, hopefully you'll be able to take it to another committee and uh, they can review it even more in judiciary. Certainly look forward to, looking forward to working with you, Senator Runner. Thank you. Thank you. Not necessary. The um, bill has been moved. Let me just say I wanted to um, uh, I appreciate the work that you have done this last week. I, too, reflect the comments made by uh, Senator Munning and Senator Block. Um, this bill does have a long way to go. And uh, while I'm not completely satisfied with um, some, of the, the, some of the movement, I, I do appreciate the willingness of, on your part and the willingness of our colleagues to continue to work on this. I do think in terms of public health, it's necessary, but I am concerned about um, the rights of our parents. So um, with that and uh, with no other comments, I think, correct? Okay, let's call the roll. Do pass to judi judiciary. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Block I, Hancock? I. Hancock I, Leva? No. Leva, no. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza I, Monning? Aye. Monning I, Pan? Aye. Pan I, Vidak? Aye. Vidak I. That's 7-2. Seven, 7-2, two. Seven, two, the bill is out. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank so you much, members. Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
So with that, let's go on. Um, can I have a, we'll have a pause for a moment so they can clear the room. And then Senator Canella. While we're waiting, why don't we, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the consent uh, calendar? We have, um, okay. yes, and so we have three items on consent and two items as consent as amended. Um, it's SB 123 Lou, consent to health. SB 410 Bell, consent to business and professions and economic development. Consent, SB 708 Mendoza, it's plain consent. Consent as amendment, Galgiani. Consent as amendment to governance and finance. And uh, SB 725, Hancock. Consent as amended. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent? So moved. Okay, thank you. Let's take the roll. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, I Monning. Aye. Monning, I Pan. Aye. Pan, I Vidak. Aye. Vidak, I. Nine zero. Nine zero. The bills are the bills are out. Okay. So, um, Senator Canella, welcome to the committee. It's SB one thirty one. SB one thirty one seeks to address the shortage of physicians in the Central Valley by appropriating one point eight million dollars for the San Joaquin Valley Prime Program. There are currently 27 students enrolled in the SJV Prime Program. This bill will allow them to enroll up to 48 students. California is facing, uh, facing a shortage in the number of positions available to serve residents uh, in the San Joaquin Valley uh, and rural areas. And San Joaquin Valley is federally designated as a medic, uh, medically underserved area. Implementation of the Affordable Care Act has provided and will continue to provide millions of Californians with health insurance, but access to coverage does not necessarily translate into care. The San Joaquin Valley is severely impacted with fewer primary care physicians and specialists than are recommended by the nationally recognized benchmarks. UC Prime is an uh, innovative training program focused on meeting the needs of California's underserved populations in both rural communities and urban areas by combining specialized coursework, uh, structured clinical experiences, advanced independent study, and mentoring. The San Joaquin Valley Prime Program is a collaboration between UC Davis School of Medicine, UC Merced, and the UCSF Fresno Medical Education Program. The goal of the San Joaquin Valley Prime Program is to attract medical students with strong ties to the Valley who are interested in returning and practicing in the Central Valley. Despite the enormous benefits, the SJV Prime Program lacks funding to increase enrollment that is needed to meet the uh, region's health needs. This bill would provide the necessary funding to continue this important program. This is a bipartisan effort, and I'd like to thank the co-authors for their support for this cause. Expanding the Prime Program will increase the number of students who can be admitted and provide a long-term pipeline of physicians that understand the need for access to quality health care in the Valley. Uh, with me today, I have a few of the students in the SJV Prime Program here to testify. Okay, thank you. In support of the program, and briefly, please. Hello? Hello? Oh, just so want to thank you, first of all, for um, letting us testify and uh, speak about our program, and I want to uh, thank my classmates for being here. Uh, we have exams and uh, this Friday and finals, but this is so important for us to be here and advocate. Uh, so my name is Angel Mendoza. I'm a first-year medical student at the SJV Prime Program, and I'm from Livingston. 
Um, and I just want to show how proud I am I'm from, from being from the San Joaquin Valley. You might not know where Livingston is. Um, in fact, when I went to college, a lot of people, when I told them I'm from the Valley, and I went to school in LA, they thought the San Fernando Valley. So <laughs> it's, uh, not many people know about us, and um, it's a large area, and it's medically underserved. But these people who, who live here, they're deserving, deserving of equity care as much as anybody else. They give so much for the, our, our state. Uh, so agriculture is the biggest industry, and a lot of them, like my father, work in the fields, uh, picking tomatoes. His bonus was taking a bucket home. After working, earning 25 cents a bucket, that was his reward, uh, extra reward. So, uh, and his is not a unique story. A lot of us probably share similar backgrounds. And the things that we inherit from, from our parents um, is that we, we developed grit and intelligence. Uh, to survive, to overcome where we came from, you have to have that. And we just translate that to our education and to uh, our strive to serve our communities in what it lacks. And it's, um, it's not in the, um, I don't think it's a wrong association to think that uh, medically underserved areas that ha does, doesn't have doctors is deserving of a medical program to uh, create doctors for the valley. So this program is a gem. It attracts, I think, the most intelligent people from the state, except prior, we would go all over because there was no program. We would go to, um, to the East Coast, um, all over Southern California, Southern California, but this program brings us together. And we're already making impacts. Uh, this summer, we've, uh, we're gonna go to Fresno. We're gonna be um, learning how to care for the community that we plan to serve. And uh, we're gonna be working with students um, and this program is basically training the sons, daughters, and allies of the San Joaquin Valley to serve the community they plan to, to stay for the future. And training there will help us um, become better doctors and, um, and we'll establish our roots there and serve there for the future. Thank you. Please. It's closer. Hello. So hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yolanda Tinajero. I am from Corcoran, California, which is part of Kings County. Um, I'm also a first-year medical student in the SJV Prime program. So I wanted to just paint a little picture about the San Joaquin Valley for those of you that don't know much about my community. So if you were to drive in the roads of the San Joaquin Valley, you would see the great richness of my community. And you can see what the strength of my community is, which is agriculture. My community prides itself in being the agricultural powerhouse that makes the cotton for your clothes the milk that you drink in the mornings, and also the fruit that colors the tabletops. So with that though, as you dive a little bit deeper into the communities, you'll start to see that there's something essential that's missing, and that is the clinics, the physicians, and the specialists that, are sh that should be there to provide quality health care for all of our community members. And that is exactly the goal of the San Joaquin Valley Prime Program. We want to create physicians who are going to come back to these communities that are lacking the doctors that are so desperately needed. One of the strengths that I see from my program is that we are selecting talented individuals. And unfortunately, every year we're seeing that we're letting some of these go, as Angel mentioned, to some of the other schools that sh these students should be here. So that's one of the things that I think you should keep into consideration. Another thing, though, is, that is great of our, our program is that not only are we creating physicians who are going to be providing excellent quality health care, but we're also making leaders. And I think that today you're seeing some of this leadership um, exemplified in this talk. But also, my prior or my former um, classmates are already graduating. They're getting into competitive residency programs. Others are already doing mentorship in the Valley, just so we can recruit more of our um, intelligent students to be those physician leaders in the future. And with this, I just want to ask you to please stand and support us. Continue and to help us to make our goals possible, and that way we can continue to provide health care for our community, and that way they can continue to be prideful of their goal of being that agricultural powerhouse. Thank you very much. Please, briefly. Good morning. My name is Arturo Gasga. I'm a first-year medical student as well. Um, I'm from Fresno, California. And I would like to share why I decided to go into medicine. Um, through multiple experiences, but the main, main experience that I had was working in an emergency department in Fresno. Um, that emergency department um, lacks many services that could be provided to the community. 
uh, multiple times you, you see patients come into the, the emergency department that lack primary care doctor. And for this reason, you, you don't see them when you can prevent a disease, but you see them when the disease is so worse that there's a lot that you have to do for them. Um, multiple times I, I can recall seeing patients being sent from Fresno out to bigger hospitals in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and that's because we lack the specialists. For example, we lack um, GI doctors, we lack surgery doctors, and, and that's a, a, a very, very um, important issue that we need to address. Um, and for this reason, um, I decided to, to apply and become part of the San Joaquin Valley Prime, because in this program, I get the opportunity to interact with people that are committed to, work, committed to working in, the, in this community, um, that they, they know what could be done, and that they are able to teach me the skills that I will need in the future to, to become part of this community, to be a leader in this community, and to be able to um, address the issues in this community. Um, I'm very happy to be in this program because I get to interact with my classmates and physician leaders that are leaders in the community that take initiative to develop strategies to slowly um, get down to the valley. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, this, this year, um, our group decided to develop a new program um, that we call REACH SJB. And through this program, we would like to um, work with community organizations um, so that we can learn more, more about them, so we can become more educated and know what to do with, um, and learn more about the needs of each individual community. We're going to be doing some clinical work to enhance our skills to become better physicians in the future. In addition, we need to do some research to learn more about what needs to be done in our community so that we know how to address it, and we'll be doing that too. And finally, we need to worry about our next generation, and for this reason, we're going to be doing some mentorship and students in Fresno State. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and please help us. Thank you very much. Please. So my name is Anthony. I'm from Lancaster, California, and I have ties to Bakersfield, California as a student, as an instructor, as a researcher. I just want to exemplify my colleagues as what I feel is the strength of the San Joaquin Valley. You have these people who are dedicated, diverse, and very proud of where they come from. And not only do you have these three of my colleagues up here, you have a whole community of these people. And for a community that provides so much for California and for countless other people in the United States, why is it so difficult for them to be taken care of? As you know, there is a physician shortage. As you know, that there is difficulty in access to health care. Not only that, but to quality physicians. Why is that so difficult for a community that provides so much for us? And so I'm a proud member of SJB Prime because this is what I can do. This is what I can do with my time, with my energy, and with my abilities to help people. And I ask the committee that what you can do is support our bill so that we can expand the program so we can retain talent and so we can nurture future physician leaders that will change the healthcare landscape in the San Joaquin Valley. And I firmly believe that a commitment to this program is a commitment to the people of the SJV and also to a healthier California. So I ask the community to please help us help people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in support of the program? Please come forward, and uh, the students can vacate their chairs to make room for others. Jody Hicks with the California Academy of Family Physicians, and this is an important pro program, and we're in strong support. Thank uh, you. David Gonzalez on behalf of CAPG, our providers are responsible for the care of some 20 million patients. We're very happy to support this important investment. Thank you. Okay. Carrie Hydash, Family Healthcare Network, a community health center in the Central Valley, in support of the. Thank you. Mark Engstrom, Central Valley Health Network, in strong support. Thank you. Any others in support? Is there any opposition? I don't think the committee received any. Are any questions from members? Senator Mitt Hancock. Um, I would move the bill. I think we all voted for this bill last, last year. year. Those of us who are on the committee, it's a good idea, and hope it goes. It can survive. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And the bill has been moved. Any other questions or comments? All right. Let's call the roll. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Hancock? Aye. Just want to make sure you did Hancock, this. Hancock, aye. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Penn? Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Six. Six votes, sufficient for passage, but we'll keep the roll open for absent members. Ah, I see in the audience we have um, Senator DeLeon, pro tem, with SB 548. Item 13. How does he do that? <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, as well as colleagues. And we'll make this very quick. I know we have Senators uh, Mark Leno as well as uh, uh, Ben Allen uh, here today also as well. Uh, Madam Chair, as well as uh, members, I am pleased to present SB 548, the Raising, Care, Raising Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act. With nearly one in four Californians lacking basic standards of food and shelter, our poverty rate is staggering. Tackling poverty and income inequality is not only about creating jobs, we also need to support working families so they can make, take those jobs and excel. Millions of parents face impossible choices every day. Without reliable childcare, they can't leave to go to work, and without work, they can't provide for their families. High quality child care and early, child, early education strengthens the economy by helping those, these families to work and helping their children to thrive. We need to design policies with these concerns in mind. This bill will increase the availability of subsidized child care spaces for the state's poorest families. With such a high proportion of low income work occurring outside of a standard 9 to 5 time frame, it is especially important that these spaces be concentrated in voucher-based programs that allow parents to choose child care settings that best meet their needs. This bill will also strengthen child care and early education jobs, providing providers a seat at the table. With stagnant wages and increased child care costs, child care providers take home pay that is below poverty level. No one who works full-time should have to live in poverty. By empowering providers to organize, they can bargain over issues, improve child care quality and access, including provider recruitment, retention, program administration, pay procedures, as well as rates. SB 548 will also establish a means of identifying gaps and recommending improvements in providing access to education and training. Our child care system is as strong as the professionals on the very front lines. In conclusion, SB 548 is an important piece of our economic puzzle that will strengthen our state's commitment to child care and greater equality of economic opportunity for our most neediest families in California. With that, Madam Chair, Senator Runner, as well as colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Um, good people in favor of the bill. Did I get it? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator, do you have uh, support? Would like to speak. Yes, Michelle Castro, the Service Employees International Union. We are one of the sponsors of this measure. Mm -hmm. I am here to answer questions, but we'll de uh, defer my time to Tanya McMillan, who is a child care provider, and Camille Maven Kara, who is a parent. Good morning. I just would like to share with you that every day I see the importance that I play in the lives of the children that I serve. I see the difference that I make in their lives from helping them develop their fine motor, motor skills with things like hold, learning how to hold a pencil. I make sure that they're kindergarten ready when they leave my child care. I help them with social skills like manners and sharing and respect. And I guarantee that every child that's in my child care gets a balanced, healthy, and nutritious meal. And I can never overlook the fact that I am a mentor and um, a go-to person for their parents who are working jobs, and in many cases, working a job, and in many cases, multiple jobs. So I'm very proud of the work that I do, even though I've been working in a child care system that has not changed the reimbursement rates for over a decade, that's full of red tape and loopholes, and at the end of the day, after expenses, my earnings are less than $5 an hour. I ask that you support SB 548 
because the child care system right now, like I said, it has regulations that are completely outdated. And there really is no representation for workers like myself who actually does this job every day. I've been doing this 21 years. I love my job. I love the families that I serve. But I need to have a voice at the table so that when the grown-ups come together and we decide to make a decision, I've had some input and I've shared my expertise in this field that I love so much. And not only will that benefit me, but it will benefit the children that I serve. It'll, all, it'll benefit their families. And so I'm asking you today to please support SB 548. It will only make this state of California better, and it is definitely an investment in our future. I poured my heart and my soul and money and time into this business. I could have walked away. I will never walk away. I have made a decision to stay here and fix it because it is a system that clearly is in dire need of reform, and I want to be a part of making it better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're very important in the lives of children, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and your time you spent here. Next, support. Hello. Good morning, committee members. My name is Camille Mahancar, and I am a parent from out of Stockton, California, with three children. I'm here to urge you to support SB 548, the Raising Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act. This act will help parents get to work by expanding the number of children served and engage parents in the important task of raising the next generation of smart children. In 1999, I finished my military duty with, as a divorced mother of two children when I came back to California, and I was giving child care assistance while I went to college. Now, my two older children are graduated with honors, and my oldest has a full-ride scholarship to college. Later, I remarried and had another son, but I lost my child care assistant. Through this combined income of me and my husband, even though it was better than my own alone, was not good enough. My husband and I had to struggle with coordinating our shifts due to the fact that we could not afford quality child care. I would drive my son two hours each way, to my father-in-law because this is all we can afford was for him to watch our son. It frustrates me because I serve this country and I cannot find quality child care as a veteran trying to make a life for myself and my children. I use this travel time to educate my son, but I noticed at the age of three he was not speaking properly. Due to this patchwork of care, my now eight-year-old, who is very smart with everything else, but he is below when it comes to his reading and speaking with his peers. It pains me to see my son suffer and not being able to read at the grade level with his children because he is, excuse me, he is teased by the other children because he is not as smart as them. We do everything in our best power and inhale over high water to help him. And it's taken a whole family to do this. Tutoring is costing more money than child care to even get him the help that he needs. Quality child care works for parents and kids. Every child should be guaranteed a seat in early learning so they do not have to suffer with the price and the price that it will cause in the long run for these parents and the kids for not being able to read. Thank you, and please make this a priority. Thank you. Next. We also have Derek Hodges here, who is also a parent. Thank you. Thank Good morning. You. My name is Derek Hodges, and I'm a single father of three. I am here asking that you prioritize supporting and expanding child care assistance by voting on SB 548. I know that child care works. It works for children, parents, and it works for our whole community. I was a single dad divorced at a young age. I raised my two children by myself in Chicago. Thanks to my mother who worked in child care, my children received great care and early education and I received great advice. Through the daily interaction at the child care, they were able to get started early, learning important social skills so that they were able to learn quickly. They learned nutrition and health as well as the foundation of academics and they were nurtured. When they started school, they were ready. Now I have two children with master's degrees. My oldest daughter is a case manager with the Department of Veterans Affairs in Houston, Texas, and my son is a major in the United States Air Force stationed in Tokyo, Japan. 
My youngest daughter now is in college at Tennessee State University, her brother's alma mater. Please make childcare affordable to more children. Support the Raising Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act, SB 548. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Anybody else in favor to speak? Give up your seats there. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Young. I'm with the California Labor Federation. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the co-sponsors of this important legislation. Um, this bill is extremely important, and it does uh, two important things, which is expand access and improve quality of the system for children, for parents, and for providers. And we believe that these important goals can be achieved through a collaboration of all these parties, children, parents, and the state. Uh, we thank you, and we urge you to support this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Anna Levine, Senior Staff Attorney at the Child Care Law Center, and I am here to express our support for this bill. Great, thank you. Good morning, Deborah Brown with Children Now. We're also in support. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman uh, and members of the committee, my name is Willie Pillow. I represent the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. We ask for your strong support of the bill, and we want to thank both the pro tem as well as the speaker for being the authors of such a valuable and important public policy to move it forward. We ask for the members of the committee to support the children in the state of California by supporting this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Good morning. Good My morning. name is Ruth Banks. I am a five-star quality rated early educator, family child care provider from Lakewood. I came to Sacramento today to give my support for SB 548, uh, the Raising Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act, which so many out there who don't have quality child care, I am glad this bill will expand access to children and provide more support for parents. Most importantly, Senators, for the continuance of quality child care, this bill would give family child care providers like us a seat at the table through collective bargaining rights. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Briones, and I'm a child care provider from Victorville. I stand here today in support of SB 548, the Raising Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act. I'm excited about the possibility of training partnerships that will allow child care professionals like me to continue working on our VAs in early education. And I can't wait until priority like me have bargaining rights to have a strong voice in our industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody here in opposition? Any members would like to say something on the dais? Yes, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just thank the author and especially the people we heard testifying, both parents and providers. Uh, they truly are the front lines of the future for our state. Um, these kids don't get a second chance. So I want to thank the author. Glad to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Would you like to close, Senator? Chair, sure, thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and I respectfully ask for an aye vote. Okay. Anybody making a motion? Senator Block. Okay. Do pass to Labor and Industrial Relations. Blue? Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Morning, I Pan Vidak. Okay, it's uh, one to one. Three to one. So a few members are missing. I'm sure we'll uh, add the vote up when uh, we get done at the end. Sure. So, Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank and, you very much. And before I leave, Madam Chair, I just wanted to encourage uh, our colleagues here in a bipartisan manner uh, to support SB 499, Madam Chair. Uh, Lou will be presenting this measure that we are okay. uh, co-sponsoring, uh, uh, so I just uh, highly encourage uh, dealing with teacher effectiveness and quality. Okay. Thank you much, Madam Chair. Thank You've done you. a great job. Thank you. Okay. Senator Leno, is he here? I see him right there. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. 
Let me begin by accepting the amendments suggested in the analysis as author's okay. amendments. So this bill deals with admission and disciplinary policies at our public charter schools here in California. And let me say right off that we have some extraordinary public charter schools in the state. I have a number of them, fortunately, in my own district. But the United States Department of Education and the United States Department of Justice have both raised some serious concerns, which I believe we need to address. This bill ensures that charter schools, as part of the statewide public school system, have non-discriminatory admission rules, as well as suspension and expulsion policies that guarantee students appropriate due process. California Education Code clearly states, quote, a charter school shall admit all pupils who wish to attend the school, unquote. Charter schools are part of the single statewide system of public schools and therefore are not exempt from this mission. However, because of a confusing requirement in the Education Code that states charter schools should list admission preferences, if applicable, on their petitions, some charter schools have implemented discriminatory policies designed to allow only the most desirable students and to screen out students who may have lower standardized scores. A few examples of these discriminatory admission policies include mandatory parental volunteer hours, which you may have read about, also minimum English proficiency and minimum grade point averages. These discriminatory practices harm students of color and students of low-income families. Data shows that low-income students, English language learners, and populations in need of special education services are served less often at public charter schools than at traditional public schools. This results in traditional public schools serving a disproportionate number of these students without any additional funding for them. These students deserve equal access to all public schools and should not have any barriers to their academic success. And then with regard to disciplinary policies, under current law, a charter school is not required to list in detail its policies for suspending or expelling pupils in its petition to become a charter school. Charter schools are also exempted from following the existing statutory due process protections relating to the suspension and expulsion of students at public schools. As a result, charter school students can be denied their right to due process. It's not surprising that the data collected by the United States Department of Education demonstrates that suspensions and expulsions occur at a far higher rate at charter schools than traditional public schools. This bill ensures that all of California students receive appropriate due process at public schools by requiring charter schools to follow the Education Code suspension and expulsion policies. The U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice have weighed in on both admission and disciplinary practices at charter schools. They have urged states to ensure that the civil rights and due process rights of all students are protected. And I believe it's time for California to listen. I would ask for your I vote. We have a number of witnesses today. First, we have Dr. Julian Vasquez, uh, Heilig, Heilig, Director of the Doctorate Program of Educational Leadership at Sacramento State. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'm honored to sit before you today. Um, I'm also a former charter school instructor, parent, and board member. As a caveat, I must state I testify as a subject expert and not as a representative of CSU or my campus. My testimony will address two issues very quickly. The representativeness of charter school demographics and is SB 22 civil rights. I will begin by comparing charter demographics with traditional public schools. I will utilize the most recent federal data obtained and licensed by the U.S. Department of Education by Dr. Francesca Lopez at the University of Arizona. You can conduct eyeball tests of various percentages between charters and traditional public schools in the state of California, but a recent study by Dr. Francesca Lopez using, and let me be the stats professor just for a moment, an age statistical test to test the representativeness of different demographic groups in California was conducted. 
And what the findings show is that African Americans are actually highly overrepresented in charters across the state. Latinos are underrepresented, as well as ELLs, special ed, and free and reduced lunch. The other question I'd like to quickly address is SB 322, Civil Rights. The UCLA Civil Rights Project recently weighed in on SB 322 in an open letter that I posted on my education policy blog, Cloaking Inequity. They posited that there should be no exceptions in discipline for charter schools. They wrote, our published research supports the proposed changes offered by Senator Leno and SB 322. All public schools, including charter schools in California, should be monitored closely for due process and civil rights violations, as well as other data that may help or prevent unlawful exclusion. It's imperative that charter schools fully comply with all state and federal discipline requirements and charter guidance to ensure that the civil rights of students in California are not violated. SB 322 will help charter schools in California fulfill these goals. In conclusion, therefore, I concur with the UCLA Civil Rights Project in their support of SB 322. From Chile to Denver, the predominance of peer-reviewed research has demonstrated that choice can be problematic without regulation to ensure equity, access, and civil rights. SB 322 will ensure that authorizers and their charter schools remain accountable to, accountable to California's communities and citizens. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Thank you. Seth Bramble here on behalf of the California Teachers Association, proud to co-sponsor this important legislation. Truly what this legislation in part is meant to do is ensure that the admission requirements and preferences at charter schools are similar to what's permitted in the traditional public school environment. Some examples of some uh, admission criteria, uh, preferences, admissions requirements uh, that we're seeking to eliminate in the charter school uh, environment include, as was mentioned by the Senator, requiring volunteer hours. Recently, actually this year, uh, Public Advocates put out a piece of uh, research regarding their, uh, they looked at 500 schools and they found essentially that 30 percent of those schools, I mean, my math is slow, that's probably like 160, 165 schools or so, had uh, volunteer hour requirements. Now, uh, that may work if you had two parents and, you know, one was working and the other was home and was available to uh, volunteer at the school. Some of these had up to 80, 90 hour requirements a year. So for a you know grandmother who's working two jobs uh, and they, they may, that family probably won't even apply to this school when they see this set of requirements. It's a deterrent when they actually see the application. One quick example, at Santiago Charter School authorized by Orange Unified School District, they require 12 service hours and that parents fill out a form indicating whether they would like to volunteer for those hours or donate money. Quote, for every $10 donated, you will receive one service hour credit. That's an example of the kind of discriminatory uh, admission requirements we're talking about. A second one, academic, the senator mentioned that also, that, that in some cases, particularly in San Bernardino, a charter school named Public Safety Academy made headlines this year about having a minimum GPA of 2.0 to get into the school. Now, in some cases, you do have magnet schools as part of a larger school that have a GPA, or we've seen gate programs as part of a school. That's different from having a GPA requirement at you know the entire school where the charter school physically is not letting people in who are not achieving well, particularly with respect to the fact that in 92, when charter schools were established in the state of California, one of the explicit purposes, and I'm reading from Ed Code, about why charter schools were created was to increase learning opportunities for all pupils with special emphasis on expanded learning experiences for pupils who are identified as academically low achieving. So if you're meant to serve low achieving students, it doesn't make sense to have a 2.0 GPA bar. Increasingly, we've seen these admission requirements and preferences getting more and more creative. One of the most creative ones I saw was here locally at uh, Natomas Charter School that has in their lot lottery policy, yes, it has a performing arts mission, and yes, they have auditions. I would suggest that as a taxpayer, and my son takes piano lessons, even if he was really horrible at piano, he, you know, my, my tax dollars fund that school. He should be able to attend that school regardless of what his ability is at piano. But specifically in their preferences, they include a preference for elected advisor to the board. And I would submit what is an elected advisor to the board. To me, what that means is a school board sits together and maybe they elect somebody whose kid gets a special preference to come into that school. Those kinds of creative preferences should not be allowed. They're discriminatory. And so what we're looking at here is... Um, 
and, and these are the result truly of like an hour of Google research on the internet. So if those are the ones that are public, uh, you can imagine how many other types of admission criteria and preferences haven't been put out to the public and are also uh, you know, limiting student access at charter schools. Charter schools are public schools. They must be available to all students. We urge your I vote. Uh, Catherine Williams with the ACLU of California. We're also proud co-sponsors of SB 322. Um, we believe that this bill will provide basic protections for students in charter schools and ensure equal opportunity and fairness to each and every public school student in California. We share a lot of the same concerns that the senator raised um, and NCTA raised about admissions policies. They, in effect, exclude students of color and students from low-income families from attending charter schools, and they are a barrier to free uh, and equal education in California, as is constitutionally guaranteed. We're also very concerned about the due process, uh, lack of due process uh, protections afforded to students who face suspension or expulsion from charter schools. The only procedures that um, are required are those procedures that a charter school voluntarily elects to include in its charter. In, in contrast, traditional schools must follow statutorily prescribed disciplinary procedures. These procedures serve as basic protections. They ensure that a student is not suspended or expelled for reasons such as having a low GPA or for willful defiance. They serve to provide the right to be informed and to respond when the extraordinary step of a suspension or an expulsion is attempted. We can and we do work with students in charter schools to ensure that these discriminatory and insufficiently protective policies are erased. We know these policies are not formed out of malicious intent and are pleased when a school elects to resolve them with ease and immediacy. We are disheartened, however, by the fact that even a few of these violations have occurred and fear that many parents do not know or do not have the time to reach out to the ACLU or others for help. Thus, we see a real need for clarification in the law. We appreciate the unique educational experience that charter schools provide and believe that more clarity in the law will help charter schools to meet their unique educational goals without inadvertently excluding underserved, underserved classes of students. The legislature should step in to provide guidance when a student's rights are not secured. And for these reasons, we would strongly encourage your I vote. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Ron Rapp from the California Federation of Teachers. We are a proud co-sponsor of SB 322. We believe that charter schools in California must, be allowed, must, <clears throat> must not be allowed to create their own selective admission policies that prohibit students from enrolling or unfairly push students out who are already enrolled. As public schools funded with public dollars, charter schools must be held to the same admission policies as all public schools. In addition, charter school students must have the right to due process related to suspensions and expulsions. Research conducted by the Annenberg Institute for School Reform suggests that minority students are disproportionately suspended or expelled from charter schools. Oftentimes, students in charter schools are not afforded adequate due process rights in these disciplinary decisions. Finally, teacher turnover in charter schools is perceived to be high compared to turnover in other public schools. SB 322 will require school districts to collect data on teacher turnover so that the issue can be examined more closely. And for those reasons, we respectfully urge an I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. My name is Tristan Brown with the California School Employees Association. We are here in strong support this morning to ensure equal opportunity and due process for students in charter schools, uh, the protection of which does not impact the quality of education in the classroom for these schools. So it's important to protect these tenants of public education uh, and realize that they will only help students not hinder any uh, <clears throat> educational delivery services. We ask, we urge an I vote this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Mark Holtebeck, a special education teacher at California Virtual Academy, one of the largest, uh, the largest charter uh, virtual academy school in uh, the state. I support 322, especially with regards to the teacher turnover, teacher turnover in, in uh, charter schools is particularly high, especially with my, my school in particular, and it needs to be tracked to monitor. Next, please. My name is Jen Shilin. I am a charter school educator in support of 322. All students should have equal access to public schools. Thank you. 
Peter Minette, I teach kindergarten in Nevada County at the Fen Valley School District. I urge yes on 322. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, LeAngela Reed on behalf of San Francisco Unified School District in support. Thank you. Good morning, Diana McDonald, on behalf of California State PTA, we respectfully request your I vote. Thank you. Okay, any others in support of the bill? Those opposed to the bill, please come, oh, excuse me, yes. I'm sorry, Michael Young, California Labor Federation, also here in support. Okay. Back. I apologize, uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. My name is Willie Pelot, representing the American Federation of State County and municipal employees where we represent a lot of classified school employees. This bill is important, and if you've taken the time to read Diana Ravage's book, American School System, you will absolutely see that even when they deny equal access to every child, they have failed miserably to outperform public schools who take every child. So it is time for the legislature to address the systemic disparity within the school system and support this bill because it's a very important public policy to move forward that if you're going to get taxpayers' dollars, then you're held to the same standards as those that then receive those dollars in the public school system. We ask for charter schools to be treated no differently and ask for the strong support of the members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any others in support of the bill? <clears throat> Opposition, please come forward. Madam Chair, as opposition has come forward, I just wanted to reiterate, as you were out of the room, uh, that I've taken the amendment amendments. suggestion on the bottom of page six as Great. author amendments. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, again, here four and lots of me too's. Okay, welcome to the Thank committee. you, Madam Chair. Rand Martin on behalf of the California Charter Schools Association. Um, I want to start with a couple of, of comments. One, we really appreciate the fact that the author has spent some time with us um, this week especially, and we really appreciate your work on this and your staff's work. Um, we recognize that the, uh, um, the amendments that the author intends to take to the first section of the bill relative to admission requirements and preferences um, is something that uh, we have uh, been neutral on in the past. Um, we're taking one last look at it, um, but we feel optimistic. I do feel um, obligated to say, though, uh, in response to the supporters, that charter schools do not adopt admission requirements and preferences unilaterally without oversight. They are part of the petition process. They must go to the school district, and the school district must approve them. So if there are preferences and if there are admission requirements, it must be done with the with the approval of the school district. A very important distinction that was not um, apparent in the, in the supporter side of the uh, presentation. Um, the second piece of the bill has to do with the disciplinary policies. Um, the proposal as it is right now would impose an additional 53 education code requirements um, on charter schools. Um, when some re-regulation of charter schools is proposed, the first question out of our mouths always is, what's the justification? Demonstrate to us that there is a problem. So far, we have not been able to get information that justifies the problem. We have taken, in fact, we have witnesses here to, to talk about this. We have taken the data from CDE on suspensions especially. Expulsions data, unfortunately, is not as good as suspension data. Um, we have used the same methodology that UCLA has done in their unreleased report. We've not even seen it. So if people are quoting it, we're not sure how they're quoting it, um, and have found that our experience with suspensions is actually better than traditional public schools. We suspend less students than traditional public schools. The, the references to national studies, keep in mind that we're a 50-state country, and those national studies are looking at all the 50 states. They are not looking at California specifically or exclusively. Um, and so things that are happening in the District of Columbia, for example, which was referenced in the author's um, office's um, notes on the bill, or fact sheet on the bill, you know, the District of Columbia is not the state of California, and what happens in D.C. does not happen in California. We feel very proud of what we do relative to dis disciplinary policies. And I should point out, once again, disciplinary policies are approved by the school district. They are not approved unilaterally by the charter school. And they are outlined in great deal. If anybody has ever seen a charter petition, it is not this thick. It is this thick. So all those things that are in two pages in the statute are actually in four or five two-inch binders. And they include expansive information on disciplinary policies. 
So if we can, if, if people demonstrate to us that there's really a problem, then, then let's, let's talk about it. But that has not been demonstrated. We've asked repeatedly for data um, that justifies the need for this uh, portion of the bill and have, have not received it. The last two items in the bill I'll hit very quickly. There are changes to the notification process where a student leaves the charter school. Again, we're not sure why that's necessary. Dropping the time frame from 30 days to 10 days is a challenge for charter schools. Anybody in education knows that there are times when students leave school and don't come back as fast as you would think they would. You're not quite sure where they've gone. Family emergencies, family vacations where the, student, where the school is not notified. In 10 days, we don't necessarily know why the student left or whether the student's coming back. We're also concerned about handing uh, documentation, uh, confidential documentation to the school district if we don't know for sure that the student who does leave us is gonna go to that school district. We're handing them student level uh, instructional data, we're providing them HIPAA data um, that is protected under state and federal law and handing it to a school district when they don't know if the school the district is gonna uh, take that student is a liability against us and a liability against the school district. The last piece on teacher turnover, we actually think there might be something useful. We don't think it should be district level. We think the policy should be set, set at, the state board, uh, at the State Department of Education and then have the districts implement. Otherwise, you're going to have a thousand different um, data collections that may not match. You're not going to have any comparability for that data. We think if it flows from the from the state down to the district, you might actually get something um, that could be useful to everybody. For those reasons, at this point, we are opposed to the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Others in opposition? Hello, Madam. Hello, Madam Chair and, and members, and thank you for letting me speak before you. Um, my name is Alfonso Paz, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Academic Performance Excellence Academy, aka Apex Academy, in East Hollywood area of Los Angeles. And I'm here to strongly urge a no vote on SB 322. I have over 27 years of experience in education in East Hollywood. Prior to Apex Academy, I was a teacher and counselor at LeConte Middle School across the street from our high school. In addition to my role at Apex Academy, I've been a proud part of the Charter School Association's working group on discipline in the charter sector. Our goal um, is to establish and share best practices in the terms of expulsion and suspension policies and to monitor how these charter practices influences. Apex Academy is a conversion charter high school in Los Angeles with 460 students. 98% of my students are Title I, 92% are Latino. The majority are first generation immigrant families and one third of my population is at high risk and already in the criminal justice system. We welcome all students anytime, anywhere. And many come to Apex Academy because they have low credits or because other schools have pushed them out. We are heavily focused on restorative justice and we have a policy of never expelling a student. We have had many success stories of our students that have turned our lives around. And here I have Peter Barahona who will be speaking to you later. In the five years that Apex Academy has been open, our college eligibility rate has gone up to 63%. We give students hope and encouragement after many schools and individuals have turned their backs on them. Currently as written, SB 322 will remove Apex Academy's ability to set our own disciplinary policies, and I would be forced to expel students. Students come to our school because other schools haven't worked for them. I would be forced to follow LAUSD's policy. This year, I had three LAUSD principals contact me to take their students, because if they had to follow the policy, these students would be out of LAUSD. I took all three students. All three students are currently enrolled, receiving social-emotional counseling, and are attending. Um, I urge you not to force Apex Academy to be like every other public school in LAUSD. Please allow us to continue to do our important work of helping troubled students turn their lives around, go off to college, get great jobs, and give back to their community. Through my involvement with CCSA's work group, I know that Apex Academy is not a singular example, but there are many charters that have also focused on restorative justice and who would be forced to change their discipline policies of SB 322 to become law. The previous speaker also discussed on suspicion data of charter schools compared to traditional schools in California. 
in California, we are the same or slightly lower than traditional schools. Therefore, I see no need for further regulation. While I know a section of the bill on admission policies is being amended, I still would like to explain our admission policy. As I stated earlier, APEX welcomes all students anytime, anywhere. Our school follows a Diploma Plus model that has been proven to be highly effective with at-risk students in urban areas. This model continues high expectations for every student, rigorous competencies-based standards aligned approach with small personalized learning environment and opportunities to make real world applications. Diploma Plus creates pathways to become successful adults by utilizing effective student-centered instructional practices, make use of technology, enhance teaching and learning, and provide tools and systems, specifically social-emotional counseling. Our ratio of counselors is one counselor to 150 students. The Diploma Plus model successfully transforms students' learning experience through the implementation of four essential successes performance-based systems, supportive school culture, future focus, and effective supports. Far from being discriminatory, our admission policies and procedures that were reviewed and accepted by LAUSD then approved our charter. So please allow our students and parents to understand the culture of Apex Academy and determine whether our school is the best fit for them. This in Information is important and we want to be transparent. As previously stated, everything in our petition was approved and reviewed by LAUSD before that school board approved it. Again, for these reasons, I strongly urge a no vote on SB 322. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Good morning. My name is Pedro Barahona, or Peter. I'm a senior at Apex Academy High School. Uh, before I tell you why you shouldn't um, vote on this bill or why you should oppose it, I would like to give you my personal story. <clears throat> I come from a neighborhood where you could wake up in the morning, walk down our sidewalk, and you could find a syringe thrown on the floor next to a bent spoon. Um, I, go through, uh, I come from a neighborhood where you walk down the street and you would find new fresh paint of gangs, of their rivals, crossing each other out, explain, telling each other on the walls how they're going to kill each other. In my neighborhood, the fact that you could be someone successful as a doctor, lawyer, engineer, any other fruitful career like that is only a fantasy that you see in TV. Why? Because most of our parents are fresh immigrants here in this country. They didn't really have the opportunity to go to school and make something out of nothing. Hardworking parents sometimes work double shifts, sometimes aren't there enough for their, for their kids. So what do these kids do? These kids turn to the streets, they turn to gangs, they turn to drugs to try to find something to fulfill that emptiness that they feel inside because they're left alone most of the time. When you don't have someone to guide you there and tell you what to do and what not to do, it's very hard to decide where to go. It's very hard to decide to do the right thing from the wrong. Now, when I started in high school, I started off at a public high school, LAUSD high school out in uh, Culver City, which is more west side, um, called Hamilton High School. I went to that school, my grades dropped. I was going through a very difficult time. My dad had just in and out of the hospital. Um, just moved in with my dad, lived with my mom the whole life. It was very tough, it was very hard, but that's, that shouldn't be a reason as to why my grades dropped, but they did. My grades dropped and I ended up moving back with my mom. When I moved back with my mom, I ended up attending Apex High School. Didn't know much about it. All I knew was that it was in a tough neighborhood, neighborhood that I had grew up on, neighborhood that I knew people that had been shot, killed, end up in hospitals um, or in jail. I went in there and I met um, Mr. Paz. <laughs> what they do at Apex Academy is that they give you a second chance. While other schools close the doors on you and tell you that you have no future, they open the doors and tell you that there's a second chance, that there's another way that you could be someone who you want to be and fulfill your dreams, that your dreams, that your dreams are something that is impossible to reach. They make sure that that's a possibility. I have seen kids turn around from being gangbangers, drug addicts, to, to being these people that have dreams, these people that are college bound, university bound, the, the people that know what they want to do in life. I'm one of them. I started off high school with about a two point, I'm sorry, 1.8 GPA. I raised it up to a 3.0, 3.2. Not, I know I could excel better, but it's the best that I'm doing right now, and I try every day. The only reason why I'm doing so well is because I have great mentors like Alfonso Paz, 
Mr. Lopez and the rest of our counselors that we have. If the doors are, if this bill is passed, the doors are shut to give us a, separate, a second opportunity to be someone that we want to be in life, to be able to make something out of nothing. So what do you do when all the doors are closed on you and you have nowhere to go? Where every other school that you try to go to says, oh, you've been expelled from a school already. We don't want to take you. And this charter school won't take you either because they have to follow the same regulations. Where do you go? So this is why I believe you guys should oppose SB 322. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Chair and members, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Robitaille, and I'm the Senior Vice President in charge of California Charter Schools Association's research and accountability efforts. As Mr. Paz referenced, our team of researchers has been working diligently with a task force of California charter schools to better understand suspension practices and statistics and to make recommendations that advance our goal for all California charter schools to be as inclusive and effective as possible. As also referenced, our research submitted to your committee finds that California's charter schools on average suspend students at the same or lower rates than do traditional public schools using publicly available data from the California Department of Education from the past three years, we see no statistical difference uh, school-wide in average suspension rates for charters and traditional public schools. When we break this down by grade level, we see similar rates for elementary schools, but for middle and high schools, we see that charter schools have statistically, statistically significantly lower suspension rates than do traditional public schools. Moreover, for every single racial subgroup, the average rate of suspensions for charter schools is lower than traditional schools. In some cases, the differences are dramatic. For African American and Latino students, the out of school suspension rates in charter schools are only about half of traditional school suspension rates. If unfair suspension practices exist at individual charter schools, we absolutely believe the school should improve and their authorizers should hold them accountable. However, Requiring charter schools to follow 53 additional education code sections, ones that have led to the higher suspension rates in traditional public schools, is not an appropriate solution. I therefore ask for your opposition to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Others in uh, opposition, please identify yourself briefly. Paul Kiefer, Pacific Charter Institute. Please oppose SB 322. Thank you. Jody Graff, Visions and Education Charter School. Please oppose SB 322. I'm Ruth Dutton um, from Sycamore Valley Academy in Visalia, California, serving 300 students. Um, I strongly oppose your opposition to SB 322. As you heard, it's unnecessary as suspension data from California charter schools is equal to or lower. In the case of my school, um, we, we compared our, our publicly available data where, where um, one out of 100 compared to district is six out of 100, so much, much lower in the case of my school. I want to reiterate that education code already requires California charter schools petitions to um, indicate what their suspension and expulsion policies are, so the issues raised of transparency and due process are not actual problems um, in California. Thank you. Good morning, Lauren O'Neill, Executive Director of Odyssey Charter School, and I'm proudly serving the constituents of uh, Chairman Liu's uh, Senate District. I'd just like to add that in partnership with my authorizer, Los Angeles County Office of Education, um, we have a very, um, we don't have any of those admission preferences mentioned earlier, um, and our suspension and expulsions policies closely align with the Ed Code, uh, and that is all done in conjunction with the support of Los Angeles County of Office of, of Education, and we, we appreciate their support over the last 16 years. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Lang, the mother of two children who are absolutely thriving at Golden Valley Charter School for eight years now, and I'm opposed. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alison Jakubicka. I have two children. Um, they are English language learners and they are special education students. I'm here on behalf of the 422 parents working, not able to be here and speak in opposition. Thank you. Hi, Joanna Hola, parent at Golden Valley Charter School. I'm also in opposition to this bill. My name is Ophelia Alonso Serrano. I'm a proud parent at Calvary Bay Academy, and I urge you to please close SB 322. Good morning. My name is Daniela, and I'm a proud charter alum of Leadership Public Schools Richmond. I am also a second year at UC Berkeley, and I urge you to vote no on SB 322. Hola, mi nombre es Dalia García, y yo vengo de Richmond, California. Soy orgullosamente una mamá de Caliber, una escuela charter. Yo me opongo a la ley SB 322. Gracias. 
Good morning, my name is Susana Landeros, and I'm a proud mother of a charter school, and I oppose to uh, SB uh, 322. Thank you. Hola, mi nombre es Mireya Mora. Yo soy una madre orgullosa de cuatro niños de la escuela Charter School y yo estoy en contra de la ley SB322. Gracias. Hola, mi nombre es Madel Alba. Soy madre de una niña de un Charter School. Estoy orgullosa de estas escuelas y me opongo a la SB322. Hola, mi nombre es Norma Pérez. Um, soy madre de un estudiante de una escuela Charter. Yo me opongo, estoy en contra de la SB322. Gracias. Hola, mi nombre es María Alba y yo tengo una hija en la Charter School y me opongo a la ley SB322. Gracias. Hola, mi nombre es Lucero Vega, soy abuela de dos niñas de la escuela Charo y me opongo a la SB322. Hola, mi nombre es Elizabeth y yo soy madre de dos hijos y me opongo a la SB322. Good morning, my name is Julissa Barron. I'm a senior at Kip San Jose Collegiate and I encourage you to oppose SB322 and the re-regulation of charter public schools and urge the committee to vote no. Coming from a Kip school, I can say most of what was mentioned by those who are for this is untrue and if this passes, it will defeat our goal to help low-income students and uh, of minorities to give them the same opportunities that wealthier communities may offer. Um, good morning, my name is Julie Bautista and I'm also a senior from Kip San Jose Collegiate. Um, I oppose SB 322 and the re-regulation of charter public schools and urge the committee to vote no because coming from a KIPP school, this defeats the purpose and its mission, which is to help low-income minorities receive a rigorous education. Thank you. Angela Lee, KIPP Bay Area Schools, which serves over 3,000 students in the low-income neighborhoods throughout the Bay Area. I strongly oppose SB 322 and I respectfully urge the community to vote no on this bill since it would hinder our ability to serve the students we aim to serve, those who receive a preference for free and reduced lunch. We, it would also undermine our efforts to use restorative justice practices in, under, in place of traditional discipline policies. Thank you. Hola, mi nombre es Elena. Soy una madre orgullosa de la Escuela Caliber y yo me opongo a la SB322. My name is Montada and I go to charity school in Richmond and I oppose SB322. My name is Jocelyn. I go to charter school in Richmond, and I oppose to SB322. My name is Dalia Gomez. I go to a charter school in Richmond, and I oppose to SB322. Good morning. My name is Chris Meheran. I'm a proud father of two daughters that attend two different charter schools based on their needs, and I'm also a proud director of core charter school, Camptonville Academy. And I'd like to add that in 10 years as a charter school administrator, We've never had to expel a student, though we've enrolled many students with suspension and expulsion records, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tiffany Acevedo, and I go to a, I'm a student at a charter school in Richmond, and I oppose of SB 322. Um, my name is Melissa Flores, and I go to a charter school in Richmond, and I oppose of SB 322. Students could speak up a little more. It's hard to tell, actually, what school you're from or, or where you're from. Thank you. We'd like to hear from you. So, um, My name is Samantha Rodriguez and I go to a charter school in Richmond and I oppose the SB322. Mi nombre es María Ledesma. Soy mamá de tres hijos que asisten a Escuela Charter y por favor les pido que se opongan a pasar esta ley. Gracias. Good morning. My name is Eduardo Ledesma. I'm a proud parent of one student at uh, Caliber Beta Academy in Richmond, and I urge you to oppose SB 322. And to the students, thank you for sharing your story. Hola, mi nombre es Leticia Contreras. Vengo de la escuela um, Caliber en Richmond y me pongo a la, a la SB 322. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Martinez, and I'm a proud charter parent of Caliber Beta in Richmond, California. I urge you to please oppose SB 322. Thank you. I, I live in Richmond. I, I, I learn from the school Caliber. 
And please support, support my school because I think it's the best school for me. Buenos días, mi nombre es Nau Cervantes, vengo de Richmond y me opongo a la ley SR 322. Gracias. Buenos días, mi nombre es Yolanda López y soy, vengo de Richmond y soy orgullosamente una mamá de una escuela charter school. Por favor, opónganse a la SB 322, por favor, toquen su corazón. My name is Daniel McLaughlin. I'm the founder and CEO of the One Purpose School. We will serve a population of 97% free and reduced lunch, um, actually in your district, Senator Leno. Um, and I'd like to say that I think neither charter schools nor the district schools that have specific admission policies should have this regulation voiced upon them. I oppose 322. Thank you. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Blanca Calderón. Vengo de una escuela charter. Tengo un hijo. Y vengo para que nos ayuden para que no se cierren las escuelas. Y estoy en contra de la proposición SB 322. Gracias. Mi nombre es Eva Oviedo. Vengo de Richmond, de la escuela Caliber. Tengo dos niños y estoy en contra de la ley SB 322. Gracias. Good morning. My name is David Calderón. I'm from Richmond, California from Calvary Charter School. And let me just say, I'm opposed to SB 322. And this is another great end story. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Hannah Imoisili. I am a proud teacher at Green Dot Public Schools um, that is effectively um, facilitating um, restorative justice. So I oppose this bill. Jennifer Wada on behalf of Ed Voice in opposition. Ana Ponce, Camino Nuevo Charter Academy, Los Angeles, in opposition. Good morning. I'm Dr. Denise Patton, the Executive Director of San Jose Charter Academy in West Covina, California. And in the 17 years of our existence, we have maintained suspension rates far lower than the district that authorizes us. I urge you to oppose Senate Bill 322. Hi, my name is Celia Harro. I'm a student at Humboldt State University in the Child Development Department, and I grew up in LA, and I attended a charter school. And um, I'm in opposition because I didn't have any of these problems. I had a really great experience, and I know a lot of the students also did. There wasn't any like special requirements to get in and preferences, and there wasn't any um, unfair suspensions or anything like that. But I do think there may be a problem at different schools, maybe in different areas. So there might there is a need for there to be changes, but I think it varies school by school, not to be implemented at all schools, at all charter schools. So I'm in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in opposition? One more. Good morning. My name is Mary Welch. I'm the um, area superintendent for Aspire Public Schools. We have 35 charter schools in the state of California, and I urge your um, no vote on SB um, 322. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other folks in opposition? Okay, well, Senator Hancock, it's just you and me, and Senator Leno. Yes. Okay, so. Um, it, did you ask me a question? <laughs> no, no, I was going to ask you a question. You seem to have uh, settled the issues with the admissions, with the uh, amendments. And uh, the question is um, following all the other rules yes. that uh, regarding suspension and expulsion. And you've heard from the opposition. I certainly Any, have a response. Yes, right. Thank you. So first of all, let me reassure everyone and anyone, and I want to thank our visiting student who is so articulate. Congratulations on all your success, and I know your future is going to be very bright. I also want to assure you, this bill will not close the doors of Apex right. or any other charter school. Uh, if all charter schools were like Apex, or like Sciatech in my district, we wouldn't be here today. And there'd be no need for the bill. They're not our concern, and they're not the concern of the United States Department of Justice or the United States Department of Education. And I am confident that we can find language that will more effectively address the problem schools while not limiting the charters that do outreach to students who need the most support. So that's going to be my effort.
to make sure that we're not tying the hands of a school like Apex, but at the same time, address the schools that have incentivized me to bring this bill forward. There are problems. I think the last speaker in opposition to the bill actually said it as well as I could, that there weren't problems at her school, but in fact, we know there are problems at some schools. So we have to more surgically address that in our language, and I'm happy to work with the committee and with uh, all the stakeholders to reach that goal. It sounds like also that there might be an issue with the folks that are supposed to be overseeing um, or monitoring the progress of charters, you know, the responsibility of the uh, um, folks, the districts that are okayed the charters, that are not doing a, a decent job monitoring what's going on. I don't, you know, uh, Senator Hancock, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I was very interested in this discussion. I have grandchildren in public school and grandchildren in charter schools. <laughs> All of your grandchildren are in public schools. Um, actually, as I said the other day, I have one home school, too. Okay. You want to know? <laughs> I didn't know experience. about that one. I didn't know about that one. <laughs> uh, but um, so it seemed to me that the admissions part of the bill right. was in very good shape. Nobody commented on it. And it is one of the areas where we have pause because there are some charter schools that do or have want that. either money or right. volunteer time from parents. And that could be uh, discouraging for some parents that don't have either of those things because of their income level. Uh, as I read the bill, I didn't see, for example, I'm very interested in restorative justice. The um, Oakland Public Schools uh, have adopted restorative justice as their model. I noticed several people speaking in opposition said we couldn't do restorative justice um, under this bill. I, I don't read the bill that way. I wondered if you could comment on that, Senator Leno. And, and I guess I'm interested in knowing a little bit more what are the problems with suspensions or expulsions in in the charter schools that have problems? So first of all, uh, no, the bill will not interfere with programs like restorative justice. Uh, the bill will not close the doors of Apex or any other charter school. But Mr. Bramble probably has some more specifics that could best address your Question, so I'm going to pass the ball to him. And, and with uh, respect to restorative justice, we did have a long conversation in the last legislative session around uh, willful defiance, around the idea that we need to figure out ways not to send kids home, that we need to figure out ways to provide supports for kids. And to be blunt, none of that conversation had any impact on the charter school environment because at charter schools, uh, the education code that we're talking about there with respect to suspension and expulsion is waived. So in other words, they weren't required necessarily to follow some of those provisions that we were establishing that truly represent a good practice at all California public schools. So there is explicit ed code that says uh, in terms of alternative to suspension and expulsion that rather than send a child home, a principal could implement several alternatives to suspension and expulsion. One of those explicitly in code being restorative justice. So in putting forth a requirement that charter schools comply with the suspension and expulsion provisions of the education code. It also then delineates what are some reasons that a child could be suspended from school, what alternatives are kind of best practices recommended through statute that a principal could use rather than send a child home. So in, in essence, I would say just the opposite. It would encourage the use of alternatives and explicitly restorative justice in forcing charter schools to comply with the suspension expulsion provisions of the education code. Some of the data uh, that uh, the uh, opposition was referencing with respect to suspension and expulsion and what the data shows is very incomplete because there's not a requirement to use the suspension and expulsion provision. So then to rely on what that data says when a district is not obligated to report that data, I'm sorry, a charter school is not obligated to report that data in the first place is extremely problematic. Uh, uh, through the chair, sure. I would have a question of the principal from the charter school. Why do you think Apex will shut down, whatever um, your comment was? Not necessarily. I, I apologize. I may have said it. Not necessarily would shut down, but I wouldn't be able to, to 
my practices, to politely disagree. I had a student, I'll give you a very specific case. I had two boys who had problematic relationships with a girlfriend. The year before in LAUSD, um, a young man who had a problem with his girlfriend went into class and stabbed the girl, and, and the girl uh, deceased. So LAUSD adopted a new policy that when there is a, difficult, a, a boyfriend and girlfriend, you must remove the kid from the campus. So we had the situation. It was a boy and girl that had been going out together. We're a co-located school, so the young lady was in the LAUSD school. The young man was with me. The family of the young lady did not want to do criminal charges against the boy. He was about to go to college. They had had a relationship. They knew the kid. They wanted an alternative. The school psychologist and the school principal were like, our hands are tied. LAUSD is saying this boy must go, he has to go. And in the process of literally the family going above the principal and saying, we do not want this policy. The school, his school, is providing an alternative for him to stay in school, stay going to, going to college. If you kick him out, it's done. And that happened another time. So I had two specific cases where LAUSD, if I had followed their policy concerning SB 322, both those boys would have been gone. Both those boys would have lost their chance to go to a four-year school because they would have had an expulsion on their transcript, and no four-year school would have taken them. Okay. I, I wondered if it was that kind of thing. I know that there have been some school districts that have zero tolerance right. for a variety of things, which would mean you would have to expel. Exactly. That you might have a school that didn't want to do that. So could you comment a little bit more on do we have information about arbitrary or more punitive ex expulsions and suspensions um, at charter schools that would make us want to do this? Or what would you suggest um, about some of those zero tolerance policies in public schools and the desire to keep kids that may be um, at risk in some way at a, a charter school that wants to help them? Seth, hit your button. Oh, yeah. Um Hit your red button. I did. Oh, just kidding. Uh, I would say there's two sides to that conversation. Uh, on the one hand, I know that recently uh, both the Charter Schools Association and CTA, not recently, I would say two years ago maybe, there was a conversation around um, what <clears throat> what kinds of protections a charter school should have if they were being sued uh, by the public? Uh, would it be similar to a traditional public school if there was a safety issue? And the conversation was just locally actually around Sacramento High School, uh, Charter High School, where, for example, a child is not automatically uh, suspended or expelled, for example, for uh, sexual assault or for bringing a weapon to school, and does that create a different standard of safety? So on the one hand, uh, I think that's part of the conversation, but I also hear what you're saying about do some of these zero tolerance policies impact uh, flexibility. Certainly the conversation around Assembly Bill 420 was just the opposite. It was a conversation that was focused on how do we uh, essentially stop sending kids home, uh, which is not helping kids, and instead help uh, those kids. So in, as again, in requiring compliance with uh, the suspension expulsion provisions of the education code, you bring that conversation to bear on the charter school community as well and encourage those alternatives. That's truly the, where the, that's the direction we're heading uh, in the legislature and we think it should apply to all, tradi all public schools, whether uh, traditional or whether charter. I would just add that um, we've had a lot of conversations with um, the charter schools associations and with the senator's office and have talked about, you know, and you've reiterated, Senator, um, you know, our goal to craft kind of more surgically to address the due process violations. And so that's something that I know has been a commitment um, both on the sponsor's part and... Um, so the senator. intention is to keep working on this bill? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. We'll have stakeholder... Okay meetings and as has just been restated of what I had said earlier, clearly we don't want to cause any trouble for the great schools like Sciatech in San Francisco, Apex in Los Angeles, but there are all, all charter schools do not operate equally and we want to make sure that those that are problematic as have been identified uh, will have to protect due process rights. And if we're here to say that there's absolutely no violation of due process, uh, I don't know that we can find some common ground, but I think no one's suggesting that and that we can find some common ground. Um, okay. okay. If so I, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, 
you've raised the whole issue that we dealt with in a way in the previous discussion with the bill about vaccinations. Uh, when is it good to do a blanket policy and when is it good to focus on the pockets of the problem and how does one define what they are? Um, so, Not always easy answers to these no, tough questions. No, I, I understand that. And, and I know that they're, in all due respect, are charter schools that are a little shaky on some of these things. <laughs> and obviously the star witnesses are the ones that are doing a great job and really pr uh, doing well for parents. Um, so, you know, I'm going to vote to move the bill forward as amended. I think the amendments were good. I, I think there's more work to do on this. So um, I'll be watching as it moves forward. This Thank you very much. Okay, and I, you know, just just to come back, I mean, I, I would just, the conversations between the Charter Schools Association is continuing um, with the stakeholders regarding suspension and expulsion. Um, yes, that's the intent. That correct, as recently as 48 hours ago. Okay, all right, all right. And all right, so uh, with that, are there any other questions or comments? Then, um, I would uh, also be in support of moving that conversation forward. And thanks to you, Madam Chair, and the committee for your good suggestions and the analysis. We were happy to take them. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the bill has been moved. Let's call the roll. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? Oh. Runner, no. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Pan? Right at three one three one. Um, we'll leave the roll open for absent members. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Senator Allen, you have item eleven, SB four sixty. Senators, uh, I come before you with a simpler bill than the one from this morning. Uh, this is you, SB. You shouldn't, you shouldn't preface your uh, start out that way. You never know where it's going to be. <laughs> That's true. Well, I've, I've got a big wooden podium here that I can <laughs> okay. touch with if, if necessary. So this is SB 460, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity to present it. Uh, this, this bill seeks to provide funding for students who have been reclassified from English learners to mainstream classrooms. And this reclassification is an achievement of our system, and often the reclassification goes unnoticed or indeed financially punished. So this unnoticed classification, though, can have policy and education outcomes for our state, and by providing some financial support for districts after the reclassification, we're sending the message that this reclassification is something we should celebrate, but also that these students will continue to face unique challenges in their transition. So effectively, we are trying to take away uh, a penalty that currently exists for school districts who efficaciously and quickly transition students from English language learner status into mainstream classrooms. We're trying to address that issue, uh, and I have here today two individuals who will introduce themselves and give their support. Great. Thank you. Please, in support of the bill. Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, Brian Rivas on behalf of the Education Trust West co-sponsors along with the Association of California School Administrators and Los Angeles Unified School District. Very quickly, I'll tell you, Madam Chair, as your analysis points out, we've got about 1.4 million English language learners. That's close to 23% of our K-12 student population. And the local control funding formula changed things in a lot of ways, but among others, it established two extra funding streams for English language learners. So local education agencies get not one, but two supplemental and concentration funding for them. Um, English learners, according to our research, also have trouble accessing grade level content and rigorous courses. So the reclassification to fluent English proficient is a critical milestone in the career of these students. As Senator Allen pointed out, 
this bill seeks to minimize or eliminate any disincentive that districts may feel when they're making that decision, which is left to, to the local districts, and provide a level of funding necessary so that reclassified students get the supports they need once they're de deemed English proficient. So for those reasons, we ask for your support of the bill. Okay, thank you. Others in support. Good morning. Leilani Aguinaldo Yee on behalf of the Los Angeles Unified School District. So California has already established that um, English learners require additional supports. Reclassification, as the others have already mentioned, it's a significant milestone, but by no means is it the end of the story for these students. Um, so SB SB 460 is a natural extension of the local control funding formula in that sense because it recognizes that our vulnerable English learner students do continue to need supports after they've, they've reclassified as fluent English proficient. And SB 460 would provide school districts with the resources that they need to continue to provide those supports. And we're talking about a very, very small subset of students. For LAUSD, out of almost 600,000 students, for 14-15, this would have impacted almost 6,500 of our students. So it's less than 0.01% of our student population population at LAUSD. Um, and so with this additional funding, we can continue to ensure that these students um, continue their progress and continue on their path to success in school. Thank you. Thank you. Others in support. Salvia Senor with the Association of California School Administrators, also co-sponsors of, of the proposal. Thank you. Good morning, Patty Herrera representing Riverside County Schools. We'd like to just recognize that federal law requires us to monitor uh, reclassified English learners for an additional two years. Okay. As um, the witnesses stated, we see, a, we see a slight decline in student achievement um, it, at the high school level in particular. And so we, we really appreciate some, uh, Senator Allen's um, authoring of this bill because we think that to provide the, the additional support to keep these kids on a positive traje academic trajectory is important. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kim Lewis representing Families and Schools, which is really um, around involving parents when their students' education is pleased to support this bill. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee and staff. Marta Alvarez on behalf of the San Diego Unified School District. We're also here in support of the bill in San Diego Unified. We have about 4,600 students who are long-term English learners. Those are students that have been a long-term EL for more than six years and they have not been reclassified. Um, it's important for the students to receive those additional supports after they get reclassified because they need that academic and linguistic um, support when they get into the mainstream classrooms. Uh, we thank the author for the bill and we wish your eyes support. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in support of the bill? Is there opposition to the bill? Good morning. This is Estelle Lemieux with the California Teachers Association. I just want to make it clear that we are not opposing on the basis of uh, these students needing uh, further help after they've been reclassified. Uh, CTA just agrees with the governor and actually some other education educational partners who believe that before making any changes to the local control funding formula, we should give it time to make some transitions. So for that particular reason, we... Uh, CTA has been very um, probably hard on it, on very um, consistent with not making any substantive changes to the LCFF formula until we see some outcomes. So, for well, that's the reason of our opposition today. Okay, thank you. Any others opposed to the bill? Any response, Senator Allen, to the opposition? Well, I, I, I this does not, this, this absolutely retains the the framework of LCFF. In fact, I actually think it advances the spirit of LCFF beyond its current form, which is that we understand that uh, English language learners do require extra resources. It's precisely why uh, we, we created a special category for them. And all we're doing here is extending out support for those English language learners who have now been transitioned into the mainstream system. If anything, uh, this very much this doubles down on the on, on the on the core goal of LCFF by by taking away a penalty that currently exists for those school districts who successfully mainstream their English language learners quickly. Uh, it's something that I saw and we were concerned about in my school district. I've talked to a lot of teachers and administrators and school board members about this around the state. Uh, so I, I um, respect the, the 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 concern that was raised, but I, I think it's ultimately it, it's a it's a, um, it, it's a kind of a procedural concern. I, I respect it. 
Uh, but, but ultimately, this is very much advancing the core goal of LCFF. Thank you. Uh, Senator Monning. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I want to thank the author for bringing this forward. It, it, it makes a lot of policy sense. Is there any evidence of school districts not advancing students who are, are really prepared to be advanced because of fear of the economic um, impact or consequence of moving them forward? Do you want to? Uh, Senator Monning, we're, we're unaware of any particular examples, um, but nonetheless, we, we believe it's a concern. Thank you. And again, it, it may be early in the process as well, but um, whether, whether proven by data or not, there, any school district that's looking at the impact of losing part of the, the increment or the supplemental funding, it's going to have an economic impact. And I would say respectfully that any of those of us who've worked in government agencies at the local level or elsewhere, uh, we can all sometimes become painfully aware of how, how, how minutia and formula can, can help to, to inspire outcomes that might not have been uh, in the broader interest. Right. And, and so I guess we're trying to, to circumvent this, uh, that, that, that um, I've seen in my own school district how sometimes we pursue things uh, that, that uh, be because of the way that a formula is written for funding, and we're trying to avoid that from happening here. And again, this is the policy committee. I'm going to be supportive. I'm just curious, um, do you know what a, an estimate of increased cost would be um, if this were advanced into law? Uh, so, you know, the, I, do you, do you have the SNI? I'm just curious. Uh, I believe your analysis uh, notes what the appropriate, this is a reintroduction of uh, Mr. Bocanegra's bill. Um, your analysis notes an estimate. I don't remember the exact figure. Um, 31 to 41 million. 31 to 41? Thank you. Um, but, Senator, um, I do want to point out we're going to be reassessing that. I'm not confident that the Appropriations uh, Committee took into account the overlap uh, between students who are also are among students who are reclassified who are also low income. Right. Good. Thank you. And again, I realize right. this will be in the province of the Appropriations Committee, but I was just curious. And thank you for uh, pointing that out to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other questions or comments from members? The bill has been moved. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Allen, for bringing this forward. I do um, appreciate your trying to s settle out the incentive here and uh, uh, make LCFF and, and the uh, appropriate programs work yep. better. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. Call the roll. Do pass to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock? Aye. <laughs> Hancock I, Leva, Mendoza, Monning. Aye. Monning I, Pan, Vida. You have four votes. Um, we'll keep the roll open for absent Thank members. You, senators. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. I thought I saw Senator Laura. Oh, there you are. Okay. Senator Laura, you have three bills in front of us today. Item 5, SB 320. Item 8, SB 376. And item 10, SB 451. We start with 320. You're going to start with uh, 320. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. SB 320 will safeguard students' constitutional rights to a free public education by improving the process for parents and students to file complaints when they are uh, when they believe they have been charged illegal student fees. Uh, a miss reports that many school districts charge student fees to participate and educational activities, I introduced AB 1575, which was signed into law in 2012. The legislation um, required the California Department of Education to incorporate pupil fees into the uniform complaint process so that students and parents can challenge illegal fees at their local school and appeal the decision through their CDE's uniform complaint process. Although AB 1575 uh, has significantly improved the situation, some schools continue to charge illegal school fees and the complaint process does not always work as intended. 
parents have reported schools resolving complaints filed by reimbursing the family that have filed a complaint but not changing the underlying policy. Other parents who have won CDE appeals have reported schools refusing to comply with CDE's ruling or re offered a refund. SB 320 will strengthen the local pupil fee complaint process and strengthen the CDE's authority over appeals so that the complaint process works better for parents and guidelines are clear to the schools. Uh, I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. In support of the bill, please. Uh, Catherine Williams with the ACLU of California. I um, can't say that we're particularly pleased to be here, but um, we were sponsors of AB 1575 and hope that the original bill would adequately, adequately protect parents and students from illegal school fees and serve the promises of free public education in California. A family's economic means must not dictate a student's educational experience. As is often the case, we are faced with a need to strengthen the process that was put in place. SB 320 will empower parents to work with schools to resolve claims of the charging of illegal school fees. Uh, we're concerned about the ongoing problems in the resolution of these claims. Informal resolutions present a distinctly disturbing approach. At least three parents, one of whom appealed to the department, reported to us that they were offered individual resolutions on an illegal school fee charged to multiple affected students. In other words, the complaining parent was offered reimbursement, but the same reimbursement was not offered to all affected students as would be required under the traditional UCP process. By fixing this loophole, SB 320 will carry through the goal of AB 1575. Furthermore, we feel that strengthening CDE's authority to help resolve appeals may avoid the lack of compliance with CDE's directives. We have been made aware of situations where an appeal was granted in favor of a parent only to be ignored by the local educational agency with no opportunity for further action with CDE. The bill before you takes a measured, balanced approach to increasing accountability and transparency in this process, and for those reasons, we urge your support. Thank you very much. Um, others in support? Uh, Madam Chair, Jeff Frost representing the uh, California School Boards Association and the Orange County Department of Ed. The CSBA was one of the um, organizations that uh, worked closely with Mr. Lara in 1575. We did end up supporting that bill. We are supportive of this bill. Um, there are a few language issues that we are working with the author's staff and the sponsors on. Um, your staff analysis raises one of those, which is the role of the State Board of Education. Right. Uh, at the end of the process. Um, we are hopeful that we can resolve those issues and be fully in support. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Others in support? Madam Chair, Senators, Seth Bramble here on behalf of the California Teachers Association. We strongly believe that every child is entitled to a free public education, high quality, and that pupil fees described here are um, impact both the access and self-esteem of low-income students. We urge your I vote. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. We're in support, despite the fact we didn't submit a letter in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Jeff Aka representing the California Association of School Business Officials. Uh, our position is support, if amended, and I would uh, simply echo the comments made previously by Mr. Frost. We very much appreciate the willingness of the author's staff and the sponsor to work with us on those language issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in support? Good morning. Patty Herrera representing Riverside County Schools. We too had concerns about uh, AB 1575 from a couple of years ago and ultimately ended up supporting the bill because we thought it, it struck a fine balance. Um, we share the concerns about some of the language issues and really do appreciate um, the senator and, and the sponsor of the bill and their willingness to work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any others in support? Please identify yourself with the, uh, I don't know that microphone is working. Is it working? No, but you can shout. Really yeah, right. <laughs> um, Peter Red, teacher of Penn Valley uh, School District. I speak in support. Fees quite simply turn into socioeconomic segregation. Thank you very much. I'm Jen Shilin. I'm a high school teacher at California Virtual Academy. Is there a junior I vote? Thank you. Thank you. Mark Holtzbeck, a special education teacher at California Virtual Academies. I'm urging your I vote as well. Thank you very much. Any others in support? Is there any opposition? 
I don't think the committee received any. Any comments, questions from members? The bill has been moved. Any closing remarks, Senator Laura? I Laura? respectfully ask for your eye vote. That's nice. Okay, let's call the roll. Do pass to appropriations, Lou. Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Pan? Vidat? Four. You have four votes. We'll leave the roll open for our absent members. Thank you. Okay, you ha your second bill is um, SB 376. 376. Madam, item Cha eight. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair and members, the intent of SB 376 is to address the increasing use of contingent or temporary workers to replace employees and the consequential negative effect it has on wages and worker protections. According to a 2012 report by the UC Berkeley Labor Center, Temporary workers in California are twice as likely as non-temps to live in poverty and are, uh, and are on the whole younger and more likely to be female, less likely to be white, and less likely to have a high school diploma. This bill requires the University of California, when evaluating bids for contract work, to evaluate the total employee compensation package, including benefits such as health care, and ensure that it does not undercut wages and benefits of existing university employees. This policy is consistent with other worker protections this legislature has enacted, such as prevailing wage requirements for public contracts, paid sick leave for workers, and minimum wage increases. This is a cost impact. This is a, a cost impact to the state when workers pay the benefits and is undermined and employees must rely on public programs uh, for assistance and health care. The, these contract arrangements are bad for workers who uh, receive lower wages and less workplace protections, bad for taxpayers as government shoulders the burden of providing benefits and support to these employees, and bad for the conscientious employers who are placed at a competitive disadvantage in the market. As a public institution and the third largest employer in California, the University of California should embrace policies to protect and respect its workers. I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Those in support of the bill. Good morning, Chairwoman Liu and members of the Senate Committee on Education. My name is Catherine Leibarger, president of AFSCME Local 3299, the University of California's largest employee union. I am also president of the California Labor Federation. I am here in support of SB 376, which would require private contractors that do business with the University of California to pay comparable wages uh, and benefits to UC employees performing similar work. A 2012 UC Berkeley study found that subcontracted building, groundskeeping, and maintenance workers are two times more likely to live in poverty and three times more likely to require some form of taxpayer-funded public assistance. In the case of UC, which already receives billions in state support, these additional hidden costs are ultimately borne by California taxpayers. Additionally, a recent ProPublica study found that temporary workers in California face a 50% greater risk of workplace illness, injury, and even death as they tend to be placed in dangerous or physically demanding jobs without proper training or safety equipment. Right now, we know that UC has at least 40 private contracts in place, ranging from custodial and food services to groundskeeping, parking, and transport services. Cumulatively, these contracts involve hundreds of workers, tens of millions of public dollars, and primarily affect immigrants and people of color who are paid up to 53% less than full-time UC employees doing the same jobs. Employees at IMPEC Group, for example, provided custodial services at UCSF over much of the past four years. These employees were paid as little as 1074 an hour with no benefits, while their peers at UC made as much as 1867 an hour, including benefits. And I don't have to tell you what a difference such a disparity makes to a family living in the San Francisco Bay Area. As this body looks for ways to address the growing problems of poverty and income inequality, the fact is that traditional employment relationships are increasingly being replaced by subcontractors, even in the public sector. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, this trend has accelerated since the Great Recession, with the temp industry growing by 41 percent, compared to a 6 percent increase in total employment since 2009. 
With this in mind, it's important to understand what SB 376 does and what it doesn't do. SB 376 does not in any way affect UC's existing collective bargaining agreements, inhibit UC's abilities to subcontract, or necessarily raise the cost of doing so. It does ensure that where such practices are warranted, private contractors are not denying their employees equal pay for equal work, driving more Californians into poverty, or shifting their labor costs onto the backs of state taxpayers. Absent SB 376, such, no such protections currently exist. With that, I respectfully ask for your I vote and would welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Others in support of the bill? Good morning, everyone. My name is Hui Ding Ye. I'm a contracting out uh, at UCSF. I work at UCSF Mission Bay. I like the work I do and uh, uh, trans this university. Uh, as a custodian with impact group, I may minimum wage, wage with no benefit, no sick days, and no vacation time. I do the same work as the UC custodians, but may uh, almost half as much. This is very hard for me and my family. Uh, UC cut the contract with MPA and now. Uh, I'm not working. Uh, I have applied to open UC positions, but I have not been hired. SB uh, 376 means so much to me and to my co workers at UCSF. Uh, many of us work two jobs to support uh, ourselves and our families. Uh, there are hundreds like me. Across the UC, uh, we are uh, dedicated uh, workers who work at UC full time, but we do not get uh, fair pay and uh, benefit like the UC workers and can help live us out of poverty and make so uh, the future UC workers uh, do not have to struggle like us. Uh, please support SB uh, 37, uh, uh, 376. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Any others in support, please? Um, good morning. My name is Pat Gant, President of California State University Employees Union, uh, SEIU Local 2579. We are in full support of SB 376. It's time for all universities and state agencies to pay a living wage. Thank you. In support. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, my name is Willie Pelota. I'm representing the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. 3299 is affiliated with our union. Some 18 years ago, the legislature stepped in and said to UC that having four classification of temp workers was unacceptable, and you made them address the issue and made all those workers full time. Today, we're right back at that same place that we were close to 18 years ago. We're outsourcing of jobs without taking into consideration what this bill would require should be unacceptable. And we're asking the members of the committee to say to the University of California that you can do better than that as an employee, employer in the community throughout the state of California. And if you are going to move in that direction, here are the different things that you will be required to do to make sure that we aren't putting people in a desperate situation and at the same time performing the great work at the University of California. We ask for your strong support for a bill that provides the kind of equality in the workplace that should be from the University of California when, it, when they take a look at those who that they're employing to perform the work for that institution. We ask for your strong support of the bill. Thank you. Others in support? Uh, Madam Chair and members, Barry Broad on behalf of the California Teamsters Public Affairs Council. Uh, we represent the clerical bargaining unit at the University of California. Um, the real issue here is simple. Is the University of California going to be an entity known for the creation of middle class jobs and a middle class society? Or is it going to become another part of the move towards lower and lower wage employment? And, and that's a real question. Our university should be a shining beacon of where we want to be, not where we could take us down to. 
Leader and I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in support of the bill? Yes, Is there opposition to the bill? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Senator Lori. You were the one. I didn't see him. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, Michael Young, California Labor Federation, also here in support. Thank you. Any others in support of the bill? Seeing none, is there opposition to the bill? Okay. Did receive a letter, right? From them, yes. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Jason Murphy on behalf of the University of California. Unfortunately, we do uh, rise today in opposition to this bill. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of quick kind of overarching uh, comments. I'd note that um, uh, it's been noted already this morning that there's been a trend within the University of California uh, with regard to more and more contracting out. I'd like to disagree with that trend. I don't think we've seen any evidence that that has been the case. Perhaps it's the case in other industries statewide and nationwide, but we've not seeing an indication of that uh, at the university. I'd also like to mention that um, the uh, text of this bill, the language of this bill, is written into the um, low bidding provisions of the public contract code. These are the low bidding provisions that the university has been abiding by for the better part of 40 or 45 years where future or past legislatures and, and governors and so forth have directed the university to try to do more with less, try to save money and try to be efficient with our use of resources. Thirdly, I'd like to note that um, I think the, uh, the underlying rationale with this bill is suggests that we are um, contracting out in all situations solely to save funds. And I'd say that uh, this, this bill affects a whole wide array of contracting out situations, many of which are not low wage at all. I think that um, indeed the university contracts out for specialized services, um, services we don't otherwise have access to with existing employees, and sometimes those are, are very high wage. So I would, I would make those, those key points. Um, in terms of the bill itself, uh, I'd like to say that um, there are protections currently in place for many of the employees that I think some of the sponsors here are talking about. As noted in your analysis, there are provisions in both of the um, AFSCME contracts uh, at the university currently, and if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to, I'd like to read real quickly from Article 5, uh, which notes, the University of California will not contract out services solely on the basis that savings will result from lower contractor pay rates and benefits for services customarily performed by bargaining unit employees or that result in the layoff of bargaining unit employees. Those are the provisions of our existing contract. Again, I have not seen any evidence that we're not following those provisions and so forth. Later on in, those same, in that same article, it notes how employees that may in some way be affected by contracting out are guaranteed a job at their same location, same rate of pay, doing the same job they previously held. Um, secondly, um, it was noted that this bill would not substantially increase the cost to the university for, um, for contracting out or for um, procurement. That's not the case. I think that the requirement that we would be calculating on a case-by-case -case basis the cost of both uh, base wage as well as benefit costs before going out to, to get an RFP would substantially increase our costs. There's provisions in the bill that um, disallow our ability to renew or extend contracts. That means we're going to be engaging in additional RFPs on a more regular basis um, and so forth. I think it puts the university into a difficult spot of having to police exactly how our contractors are paying their employees. That could potentially increase costs as well. Um, and then thirdly, again, going back to the notion that we, uh, we contract out for a whole broad array of services, I think this, this bill broadly impacts a variety of circumstances that perhaps they did not intend. Most notably, the removal of the uh, exemption for personal services. I know it's a, a somewhat um, unique example, but we have cultural and uh, concert venues on campus at a variety of our universities. UC Davis, for example, brings in Yo-Yo Ma, for example, every couple of years. Opening that up to competitive bidding would, would be a strange use of the, of the bill. So for all those reasons, uh, the university remains opposed. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, question, are there any others uh, in opposition to the bill? Okay, I'm seeing none. Uh, questions from members, um, Senator Leva. I just wanted to thank the author for bringing this bill forward, and I look forward to supporting it today. 
Uh, Senator Amani, and then Senator. Thank you. I also appreciate you bringing this forward. I guess just for clarification, um, this bill would not prohibit um, outsourcing for certain specialty services, correct? I, I, you're absolutely right, and I, I could have Catherine follow up on that if you want. But you're, yeah. you're correct. Certainly, this actually does not. This does not prevent uh, the university from uh, contracting for uh, personal services. Um, I think that, you know, to place this in context, we are not looking at 8,000 yo-yo ma's on campus. Um, if there were, then certainly it should be open to competitive bidding. Um, but um, no, it does not. And, and with that yo-yo ma example, I would think as this moves forward, there could maybe in the selection, whether it's the students making the decision or the administration of uh, outside performance art, uh, my guess is that that is not what this bill seeks to uh, to regulate. Correct, and if we need to further clarify that, we, we can do that moving forward. Great. Well, thank you for bringing it forward. I'm glad to move the bill at the appropriate time. Okay. Um, Senator Hancock? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm certainly going to support the bill today. I... Um, really believe that you know, the University of California should be a model of what we want to see in the private sector and really throughout government. And not contracting out without taking into account the full costs uh, of the labor that's required seems to me uh, to be something that just it, it is not right to do. But I do want to clarify the Yo-Yo Ma issue, if we can call it that, um, because my reading of the bill was that it deals with contracted services so that if you're going to an outside company, um, you're asking them to provide you with what kinds of benefits, hours, worker protections, and other things they have, that if you're doing... Uh, you're hiring one person. And again, um, because I represent UC Berkeley, I have an example in mind. A person I know who is a nurse practitioner who was hired to come in for several hours a week to work in the student health center um, because they have a, tend to have rush hour then. <laughs> um, and that, that is not a contracting with a private company. It's the university negotiating employment with an individual. And I'm assuming that that is not part of uh, something that the bill would cover, that that person would typically be paid whatever the university pays nurse practitioners. Could, uh, if the author could just comment. Absolutely. Catherine, do you want to take that? Um, so... Uh, yes, this covers all contracts with the university. I think that you have it right, though. The clear intent of this bill is really aimed at addressing uh, what is actually a growing trend at the university as well as across the state and across the country. Um, in that, uh, you know, contrary to what um, the gentleman from the university said, the chancellor at UC Merced announced last month his intention to construct, operate, and maintain the next 15 campus buildings under a new public-private partnership. And UC Berkeley announced that uh, similar, similarly as well uh, a couple weeks ago. So really, you know, the intent of this bill um, is, is about getting to that issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let me, um, let me, on page four of the analysis, I think the um, staff has asked some Good questions, and I'd like to see whether or not what kind of responses we get from the uh, author. And it said, ultimately, this bill would result in increasing UC's cost for procuring services and could potentially limit the pool of qualified bidders. What would be the impact on smaller businesses, particularly those who are disadvantaged or minority folks who wish to contract with UCs? Can they be competitive? Well, that's definitely our intention with this. Uh, uh, if Catherine would like to uh, elaborate. Sure. Um, so, you know, the question about small business gets raised every time, um, every time a question comes up about raising the minimum wage, for example. 
Uh, and you know, we've seen this question uh, raised for decades around um, prevailing wage. Um, but because those laws apply to every business, the playing field has never been shown to become more tilted against small business as a result of those increases. And likewise, that would be the case here. Um, every bidder is required to compete based on, a, on paying a wage that meets an appropriate public standard. Um, small, small business will face no additional competitive disadvantage. Um, just as they don't on prevailing wage public works. Madam Chair. Yes. Madam through, Chair, may I respond? Through the Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we would uh, respectfully disagree with that point. I, I think that too. in many cases, uh, some of these contracts are, are quite small, and expecting a small business to try to abide by the new RFP requirements could very well put them, put them in a right. distinct disadvantage. I think also it goes back to this notion of uh, how the university would be put into a role of having to police those private contractors in a way we've never done before. And my understanding is that to the extent that someone were to come forward and argue that um, a small business or, or even medium or large size business for that matter did not pay their employees appropriately based on the calculations that were required in the bill, the contract would be invalidated and you'd get into a you know pretty dicey legal circumstance after that point to have to be resolved um, some of the way somehow. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Madam Senator, Chair. Yep, Senator Hancock. Yeah, I, I just have to say, I don't buy that. It is always raised against minimum wage increases, and I'm sorry, we can't really. We don't want our great public institutions to lead the race to the bottom. Um, I do think, though, for the committee, it does underscore our responsibility to adequately fund the right. university. Right. And uh, we're not doing that right now. But apples and oranges. Today we're talking right. about um, reasonable protections for um, the workers who keep UC going. And I, I think the bill is important. In that discussion. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? The bill has been moved. Um, Senator Laura, any closing thoughts? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. These are critical employees at the UC who deserve, at, at some point, the basic protections. And so these are critical components to uh, the overall UC experience. Senator uh, Hancock hit the nail on the head when he said they, the greatest institution in our country cannot lead the race to the bottom. So I respectfully ask for your high vote. Thank you. Please call the roll. Do you pass to appropriations? Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Pan? Vidak? No. Vidak, no. It's 4 2. 4 2. Um, we'll hope, leave the bill on call. Thank you. You have one more bill, um, item 10, SB 451. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. I'd like to thank again the committee for the great work on, on this bill. I accept the amendments laid out on page three and in comment four and five as author amendments. SB 451 encourages K-12 districts to adopt educational school counseling programs, defines the scope of school counseling, and encourages ongoing professional development. School counselors, members we know, play a critical role in our schools, developing school schedules, keeping students on track to meet high school graduation requirements, fulfilling college admissions requirements, applying for financial aid, and a whole host of other issues uh, with our students. Uh, additional, additionally, counselors improve school climate by helping students manage social and emotional issues, as well as performing strategic interventions on issues so important as bullying. However, California members is the worst student to counselor ratio in the country, with the margin of one counselor for every 1,000 students. Further compounding the problem, unlike many professions in California's K-12 system, there is limited and outdated scope practice for, counsel for school counselors. Research has demonstrated most recently in 2014 uh, UC Irvine study that the higher number of counselors in a K-12 school is strongly associated with higher ratios of college enrollment and among other improved student outcomes. As we strive to improve our education system and implement the local control funding formula, K-12 
counselors can play a key role in addressing equity challenges and meeting the eight state priorities outlined by the LC, the local control accountability plans, which include school climate, high school graduation rates, and access to college preparation courses, among many others. SB 451 is, crucial, is a crucial first step for California to strengthen the presence of school counselors in our schools and support our students. I respectfully ask for your votes. Thank you. Uh, those in support of the bill. Um, my name is Dr. Loretta Whitson. I'm representing the California Association of School Counselors in support of SB 451. Uh, this updates the Ed Code 49600, authorizing school districts to provide the structures for a comprehensive educational counseling program to meeting the growing demands of California's K-12 students. Uh, this is long overdue. Uh, in fact, nearly 30 years has gone by since this section of the Ed Code has been revised. Uh, 49600 serves as a guide for school administrators and school counselors. Uh, it's the go-to section in the Ed Code that outlines the roles and responsibilities of school counselors in our state. Uh, education has evolved as well as the school counseling profession over the last 30 years. To say the least, and the passage of 451 is essential to keeping up with the changing times and requirements. Um, as Senator Laura said, it's very timely in regards to the local control funding formula, in particular foster care, English language learners, socially economic disadvantaged students uh, that school counselors so often reach out to. Uh, Senator Laura also talked about some of the research out there, but school counselors are very effective in uh, increasing our college going rates, uh, in particular high poverty schools. They decrease uh, suicide. Uh, mental health issues, academic achievement. There's a lot of re, uh, empirical research out there. I'd also be remiss to not say that at the middle school level, they are very effective in re reducing the things that happen in middle school like gossiping and uh, cyberbullying that we've talked about in the past. And at the elementary level, increasing our attendance rates and, um, and increasing uh, and decreasing the uh, referrals to the office and suspensions and such. So with all that, I appreciate your I vote on this bill. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Others in support? Madam Chair, Tony Trigero on behalf of the California Teachers Association. Um, since, 19, since 2008 and the Great Recession, many districts have eliminated or reduced substantially the amount of student support service personnel, including counselors, librarians, and nurses. We've not seen those positions being um, restored at this point. Um, for those schools and those with limited amounts of staff, we think that 451 provides a roadmap of best practices. Counselors provide support to students, to teachers, and to parents. They assist improving school climate, closing the achievement gap, and impacting and influencing student success. We like the notion that this is not a mandate and it merely provides the encouragement and a roadmap for districts. We think the time has come. We encourage an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Leangela Reed on behalf of the California Association for the Gifted. SB 451 will ensure services for students on of all levels, uh, on all academic, social, and emotional levels. And for that reason, we ask for your I vote. Thank you very much. Any others in support of the bill? Is there opposition? The uh, committee did not receive any. Any questions from members? I would move the bill. The bill has been moved. Closing remarks, Senator Thank Lawrence? you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. You know, this on a very personal note for me, it was a, a, a school counselor that literally saved my life and uh, that of my uh, siblings. You know, having an opportunity to speak to somebody who may not be a teacher uh, and we talk about janitors, we talk about the secretaries in the schools, all those all, and the counselors contribute to the success of the students and are able to catch our students at different points in their lives. And so if it wasn't for that counselor that said that, yes, you can read English, you can succeed, I wouldn't be here today. And so I think it's time for us to acknowledge the great contribution of our counselors and uh, allow them to come back to our schools because we know that they're uh, paramount in the success of our students here in California. I Thank respectfully you. ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, let's call the roll. Do pass as amended. Lou? Aye. Lou Aye. Renner? No. Renner, no. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Aye. 
Leva I. Mendoza, Monning. Aye. Monning I. Pan. Vidak. Aye. Vidak I. That's five. Five votes sufficient for passage. We'll keep the roll open for absent members. Thank, Thank you, you very Madam much. Chair members. Okay, Senator Gaines. You have item 14, SB 605. If anything at all, Senator Gaines, persistence may be a reward. I'm hoping third time's a charm, <laughs> huh? <laughs> but I want to want to thank you, uh, Chair Liu, and the uh, committee uh, for your help on. Uh, Senate Bill 605, and uh, we do want to accept the committee amendments to the bill. Great. And thank uh, the committee staff for working so closely with my staff to get this bill where I think it needs to be. I've introduced uh, similar legislation in the past that was uh, broader, uh, but based on the past feedback from the committee, uh, we've narrowed the bill in ways that make it a tightly focused program. This bill recognizes the integrated economy of the Lake Tahoe Basin by offering in-state tuition rates at Lake Tahoe Community College to a limited number of students who reside in Nevada. Now, this will only happen if the Chancellor of the California Community Colleges deems that there is a reciprocal agreement in place with Nevada. This will not be one-sided. Uh, the eligible Nevada students would come from uh, six small communities no more than 200 Nevada students would be eligible in any one academic year. This bill will also sunset in 2021, so we can take a look at it and uh, see how it's working. Uh, there is a history of cooperation between California and Nevada to ensure success on critical issues, such as Lake Tahoe uh, clarity, uh, that are important to both states. SB 605 is another opportunity for the states to work together for our mutual benefit. And um, so I, we're hoping that we can help out uh, families that uh, share the Tahoe Basin. And we'd love to have your support. I have some uh, speakers in support that I'd like to make a few comments. Thank you very much. In support of the bill, please. Yes, my name is Kendra Murillo, and I'm the superintendent president at Lake Tahoe Community College and have been there for four years. I sat in front of you two years ago, and you very clearly told me that you wanted us to bring back a narrow pilot with a reciprocity agreement with a sunset date, um, and we have worked very hard for two years to do something to that effect. We believe in this, and the reason we believe in it is because Tahoe is an integrated economy and uh, we work very hard together. This bill does what you asked, and again, I want to say I appreciate very much the help we've received from the Senate Education Committee staff. I think that you've tried to make this successful. I hope that um, what we're fighting so hard for is to keep Tahoe from becoming a two-class area, and that is our huge concern because we have a lot of second homeowners and we have an underclass there that works in the restaurants, the, the sometimes the, the hotels. We just did a great class for some uh, people that work in our hotels. And we also serve the community. And these are the people that are place-bound that cannot get off that hill to get education. So we appreciate your concern and your efforts to help us make this a really great community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in support? Madam Chair and members, my name is Kerry David and I serve currently as the president of the Board of Trustees of Lake Tahoe Community College. I've been a trustee for 22 years and I've been a member of our College Foundation for 20 years. I'm a member of our local community, South Lake Tahoe, for 41 years. Our college serves our community as a beacon of hope for many first-generation students as well as lifelong learners. Our students come from all walks of life and support from our students through our foundation has been significant from donors from Nevada. The generosity of one Nevada supporter of the college has provided a $5.8 million contribution for the construction of a university center. Um, that will be completed in the fall of 2018. Another donation of $250,000 from a Nevada donor allowed us to build an art gallery on our, on our campus. 
our three largest gifts have been from our neighbors in Nevada. We are indeed a community college with an invisible state line, loved and supported by our California and Nevada residents. Unfortunately, many of our Nevada neighbors who live within three miles of our college have been excluded due to a tuition that is four times the cost to residents. As one extended community, we formerly were able to provide a good neighbor policy to Nevada residents. We served over 221 Nevada students in 2011, the last year the policy was in effect. Some 22 students from California attended Western Nevada Community College, and additional students attended the University of Nevada Reno in that final year of eligibility, taking advantage of that, of that good neighbor policy. Through Senator Gaines and Senator Settlemeyer of Nevada, we have the opportunity with your assistance to serve students who may not otherwise have the ability to pursue a higher education. Let our jewel of Lake Tahoe once again be a resource to the entire Lake Tahoe Basin. Our local students have grown up playing Little League Baseball and AYSO soccer on the same teams with their contemporaries from Nevada. Our local high school competes in the Nevada High School Championships. We are one community. I started my family at the age, age of 18 and was fortunate enough to attend DeAnja College and graduate in 1970. That stepping stone allowed me to attend Santa Clara to complete my education. Please help us provide such educational opportunities for our community. We encourage your support of SB 605. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, my name is Michelle Sweeney. I'm a trustee of Lake Tahoe Community College in support of SB 605, and I respectfully request your I vote. My two children attend California's Bijou Elementary School. 2.2 miles and six minutes from the state line. Our club soccer is played on Nevada fields with our Nevada teammates. Our cycling club of California and Nevada teens traverses the border on every practice ride. With our ski teams, we gaze down from our chairlifts from the, over the state line, pointing over there, that's where I live, the edge of that watershed, subtext. California, next to our buddies who say, my house is over there, next to the edge of that forest. Subtext, Nevada. A state line cuts through my community. Lake Tahoe Community College is the American dream for students who aspire to excel in a chosen educational path under the personalized instruction of high caliber professors while having amazing air to breathe lakes to swim in, and forest paths to run. Senate Bill 605, before you, is a critical stitch in the fabric that will determine whether in 30 years there will be a middle class residential population in the Tahoe Basin. Will people live, work, and raise children in Tahoe in 2045, or will the Tahoe community succumb to the forces that would make our home a place where only the poor reside in limited numbers to serve a wealthy, non-residential population occasionally in Tahoe on vacation? The course of Lake Tahoe Community College is bound with the fate of this community. To the degree the college provides affordable access to educational opportunity and upward mobility, we resist the forces that would undermine a middle class future. My children's intuition questions the adults' state line. They ask, if Gabriel's mom wants to learn English, why doesn't she come to our college? She lives 10 minutes away. They ask, Ketzeli's grandma teaches at the college. Why does she have to pay four times more to take math classes there than the other 20-year-olds who live in California? I would like my children and their friends to grow up with the idea that, should they choose, they will be able to live a good and prosperous life in the community they are growing up in. Your vote in support of SB 605 will be a vote to maintain the integrity of the fabric that is holding together our middle class by state community. Thank you very much. Please. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. 
I'm Roberta Mason. I'm a newly retired trustee from Lake Tahoe Community College after 40 years on that board. So I was before this committee two years ago asking for you to reinstate our good neighbor policy with Nevada. And the committee uh, wanted to hear of reciprocity with our neighboring state. And we believe that now we have made that happen. I have helped, Dr. Murillo has worked so hard to bring this about. I've helped walk the halls of the Nevada legislature and they too want reciprocity. And so I think this bill does that and I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Any others in support of the bill? Brian McElhaney with the Community College League of California. Uh, we're proud co-sponsors of this bill for the reasons you just heard, and we'd al also like to thank the committee staff for working with us to make this a good bill. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Samantha Corbin with Corbin and Kaiser, representing the Lake Tahoe Community College District, just here to support with technical questions if there are any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any others in support? Is there any opposition to the bill? We didn't receive any. Any questions from members? The bill has been moved. Any closing comments, Senator? I, I would just urge an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe maybe we'll be lucky this time. <laughs> okay. Please call the roll. The bill has been moved. Do you pass as amended to appropriations, Lou? Aye. Lou I. Runner? Aye. Runner I. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock I. Leva? Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning I. Pan? Vidak? Aye. Vidak I. That's fine. Five votes, sufficient for passage. We'll keep the roll open for absent members. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate so it. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. We have, uh, just for your members' um, information, uh, item 15, SB 669 PAN has been pulled. And uh, so we are awaiting uh, item 7, SB 329 Mendoza. And I understand that he is presenting two bills in his committee and uh, will come as soon as that is over. So we're left with one more bill, my bill, SB 499, uh, item 12, which I will do. And Senator Runner will conduct the orchestra. Just to make things clear here, um, we're going to allow two witnesses to support, two witnesses against, and everybody else is going to be me too. Correct? Is it tweener? Well, we're going to try to do this. Okay. Well, it's still morning. Good, so good morning. Members, I, uh, today I'm presenting SB 499 about teacher evaluation and effectiveness. Not an easy subject. And I'm pleased to accept the amendments uh, referenced in the committee's analysis, a long list. Research consistently identifies the quality of a teacher as a single most important factor in improving student achievement. In California, we lacked a consistent or comprehensive system to measure the quality of teaching in our public schools. The media has framed this conversation as a discussion between good teachers versus bad teachers. And how do school districts get rid of really bad ones? I don't agree with that fundamental premise of this characterization. We must pivot and change the conversation to be about supporting all teachers and administrators in their ability to be effective, regardless if they are new or a veteran. This requires an evaluation system that includes professional support, training, and a fair and reliable mechanism to measure quality and effectiveness. On one extreme, you can have those that favor a teacher evaluation system that relies almost entirely on student test scores. On the other hand, there are those who defend the status quo, the Stall Act, who don't believe any changes are really necessary. 
you know, I, I've been out of the classroom for over 30 years, and I was evaluated on the Stall Act. Please, there must be changes that have happened in the middle, in these middle years. I believe there needs to be kind of a middle ground which acknowledges the value teaching the values teachers experience, but do not ignore data-driven instruction and improving teacher and student performance. This bill is an important first step in forging a compromise. SB 499 details a foundation for a comprehensive evaluation system that seeks to establish a culture of continuous improvement for all educators and improve student outcomes. The new teacher evaluation system would have the following key components. A new system is based on the California standards for the teaching profession. It requires formative and summative data to be used to inform teaching practice. It requires people academic growth based on multiple measures to be part of a teacher evaluation. It requires multiple observation to be conducted by trained evaluators to ensure the system is implemented in a fair and reliable manner. And upon any finding of an unsatisfactory performance, it will require professional development to ensure that teachers receive the system of support that is needed to improve their performance. Consistent with current practice under the Stall Act, school districts must collectively bargain their teacher evaluation process with their union. The difference here is that the specific components identified in this bill must be part of the teacher evaluation system and cannot be bargained away. In our effort to improve student outcomes, this bill also establishes an administrator evaluation system that is based on a previous bill I authored and was signed into law SB 1292, which established perm permissive principal evaluations. Building off of SB 1292, this bill requires all school districts to implement administrator evaluations based on California professional standards for education, educational leaders. Also analogous to the teacher evaluation, it requires people, pupil academic growth based on multiple measures to be part of the administrator's evaluation. Again, SB 499 is not designed to punish teachers. Instead, it establishes a system to evaluate teachers in a fair and transparent manner with the goal of providing continuous improvement while focusing on improving student achievements. And I respectfully ask for your I vote. And also, I just want to publicly thank uh, my staff and the pro tem staff, who is a co-author or a joint author. I can't remember which one, but a joint author um, for their work in this bill. Because um, we have what we think termed invited all of the stakeholders to the table uh, to uh, discuss the contents of this bill. And we have asked them if there are issues to please put it in writing and help us um, bring this bill together. And um, I hopefully, as this bill moves forward, they will come and do that with us. With that, um, I have a, a couple of folks in favor of this bill. Great. Those uh, in uh, support of the bill? Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. We're a civil rights law firm, uh, and we've worked in education equity issues uh, for many years, since the early 70s. We partner very closely with community-based organizations that represent students and parents. Uh, and unfortunately, many of our partners are not able to be engaged at the moment on this bill. Um, because they are working very hard and have much uh, less capacity than some of us do in the work they do to, as of right now, they're working in their local school districts to make the LCAP real, uh, and they are also involved at the State Board of Ed on evaluation rubrics. But I hope as time uh, goes on, we will be able to have more stakeholder uh, conversations with them because I know they have a lot of uh, thoughts. Um, we're happy to support the bill specifically because it focuses on two areas. Um, the teacher's effect on student academic growth um, by requiring uh, certain elements, including uh, uh, assessments, um, but also other measures such as uh, student performance um, on 
um, portfolios, grades, uh, and the observation of students, of teachers practice. And we think that uh, including the uh, practice focus on the six domains of the California standards for the teaching profession are critical. Now, school districts and teachers have the flexibility not to address many important elements, including the teacher's effect on students' growth and all of the California teaching standards. Um, we believe that the uh, impact of teacher evaluations um, has a great impact on students and their families. So the provisions requiring school district boards to uh, get public comment uh, during the process, uh, we very much support and have advocated for, and we appreciate very much its inclusion. We look forward to talking about whether or not it, it uh, is adequate for uh, what parents and communities want, and uh, we hope that it will not be amended out today, but that we can uh, have more conversation about that. Um, Finally, I would say that um, I was, public advocates was invited to these stakeholder meetings along with other school system advocates. And we saw amendments that took many of their concerns into consideration. So it's uh, difficult for me in part because I haven't had the opportunity to ask them directly why uh, the opposition is still there. But we believe that current law allows negotiation between uh, districts and their bargain teachers' bargaining units around both procedure and criteria, and that it does happen. Um, and ultimately, we think it's not good to impose an evaluation system unilaterally on a workforce that is not agreed uh, that it will, uh, because it won't work for uh, the workforce, and in this case, teachers, and it won't be good for students. Um, we urge you to support the bill, let it move forward, and uh, allow for the conversation to uh, make it better. Thank you. Thank you. Monique Ramos on behalf of State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson. The superintendent is in support of this bill um, and would like to note that in his first term, he convened the Educator Excellence Task Force, which created a report called Greatness by Design. That task force included several school administrators and teacher leaders throughout the state, and many of the um, elements of this bill were recommendations were greatness by design, so he believes that it's an important step. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ron Rapp, California Federation of Teachers. Um, I'm here to say that we haven't taken a formal position on this bill yet. Um, we are still analyzing it. It was amended April 9th, and so it takes us a little while to work through it and, and work the bill through our process. However, I do want to thank the author for um, authoring this bill. We think it is, it is uh, due time for us to address teacher evaluation. Um, and I want to thank her staff and the staff uh, uh, in the um, the Speaker's Office and the Pro Tem's Office for working with us. We have been in conversations over the past couple of weeks around this bill. Uh, everyone has been very open and very frank, and we, we greatly appreciate that. Um, we know that uh, teacher quality is the number one uh, indicator uh, for future student success, and uh, we believe in the highest quality educators being in the classroom with our students. Um, we have developed a set of guidelines or positions related to teacher evaluation. I just want to share them with you very quickly, and I will say that we think that this bill addresses most of these, and we're, we're happy to see that. And it's great to see a, a bill that... Um, that um, really values teachers and, um, and connects teacher evaluations to professional growth throughout their career. We think that is critical. Um, so thank you, um, um, Madam Chair, for that. Um, first of all, we believe the primary goal of any teacher evaluation system is to provide a process for teachers to improve their practice throughout their career. It's not, it should not be used as an instrument to, to uh, quote unquote, get rid of bad teachers, but it really is about um, professional growth throughout the career of the teacher and we support that. Um, we also believe that teacher evaluation should be based upon the California standards for the teaching profession. This bill addresses that. Um, 
We also advocate for the department developing a best practices or model teacher evaluation system uh, that locals can adopt or use to develop their own system aligned with the state model. We very, very strongly support that these uh, teacher evaluation systems are bargained locally. And this bill includes language around that. It maintains uh, that. So that's good. Um, uh, we believe that the evaluators must be well-trained and knowledgeable about what constitutes high-quality teaching and learning. We hear uh, horror stories about um, uh, evaluators going into a classroom. They know nothing about the subject. They've never been trained. They've never been trained on the instrument, and yet they evaluate our certificated teachers. We believe that teacher evaluation should be directly connected to professional development opportunities. Oftentimes what happens is a teacher is evaluated, but there's no avenue. There may be recommendations you need to improve here, 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 and here, but there's no avenue to connect them to those professional development opportunities. And uh, we're hopeful that this bill will, will be very clear about that. Um, all teacher evaluation systems must take into consideration the quality of instruction in light of the context within the, the, uh, which the teacher is teaching. For instance, class size, educational resources, demographics, languages, disabilities, etc. All of those impact um, the quality of, of teaching and learning. Um, we also believe, and the AFT has been a leader in this area nationally, we believe that uh, districts should be encouraged to adopt a peer assistance and review program that pairs exemplary veteran teachers with teachers who are new to the profession and those who are struggling and need assess, assess, excuse me, assistance. Um, we do support the use of multiple measures of student learning um, in teacher evaluation, but we believe that those me measures must be valid and accurate. Um, those measures could include uh, portfolios of student work, pre and post tests based upon curricular content, uh, work products such as reports, papers, or scholarly research projects, and assessments for document documenting learning progress. And so um, we do have an executive council meeting this weekend. We will be taking a recommended position to that council. Um, we are committed to work, continuing to work with the author um, and, and crafting, shaping shaping uh, this bill as we move forward. And once again, I, I want to thank the author for bringing this bill forward. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Norma Sanchez, and I'm here talking on behalf of California Teachers Association. And I also want to thank uh, the author of this bill and the staff who's provide a lot of input in this bill. We see some very valuable pieces of it, and it's a very comprehensive evaluation bill, which we really appreciate, like the words were stated before. Um, currently, CTA does not have a position on this bill, and it is because while we see many elements that we do like, there are some concerns that we have in the bill. One of them is the use of student assessment data in teacher evaluations, and we actually have some recommendations for some amendments for how to do that. We would like there to be some guiding principles that clearly articulate the adequate um, use and proper use of student data in teacher's evaluation. The other piece that we also want to stress is was stated earlier about calibration. We feel that there should be some language about how evaluators are calibrated and then also the training of evaluators. And we've also provided some amendment language on that just as long as, as well as the pupil assessment piece. We've recommended some language on that as well. Um, the third piece is that we really like the addition of the administrator evaluation piece. So it's a comprehensive both teacher evaluation system and administrator evaluation system. Um, but we also would like it to have the same level of scrutiny and um, transparency as the teacher evaluation system. Thank you. Oh, and we have a letter that we've written. So. Thank you. Are more uh, people in support that would like to testify? Okay, let's go to those in opposition. Excuse oh, me. We have one. 
Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Diana MacDonald from the California State PTA. And for the most part, we are in support of the bill. As we stated in our letter, we have um, offered some amendments to Senator Liu's office, and we look forward to working with her on those. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, opposition, if there's any, they can, I think four people can sit at the table and have their few minutes, see what happens. Okay, whoever's ready. Madam Chair and members, Brian Revis on behalf of the Education Trust West. Okay. Uh, we're in opposition, and can I just say, I'm, um, Senator Lowe, I'm sorry to be here in opposition to you. You're a friend, <laughs> been a partner, and um, but I have to be candid and say that my organization feels rather strongly about this. So I hope we can work it out. Um, we're opposed to this because we're an organization that works um, through research, advocacy, and policy analysis to close the achievement gap. We think this bill would have would be a major setback to that work because it would have a negative effect on um, standards of performance for teachers, and that relates directly to high expectations. So let me walk you through, and I'll elaborate on that. Uh, existing law is pretty clear. Evaluation procedures are subject to bargaining. This bill makes everything subject to bargaining. The entire evaluation system, subject to the limits that um, some of the supporters noted, but let me tell you why that's, that's not enough. In each area, I'm talking about standards for student achievement, things like the amount of weight given to pupil growth in an evaluation. In each area, the district is likely to want to propose a standard. The union in return is going to be positioned very strongly to demand something, either a larger pay increase, a costly benefit like retiree health care, and the district is going to be in a position to either pay or buy the, the standard that it's seeking or concede and accept a lower standard. And eventually, districts are going to run out of money. They're not going to be able to meet all the demands. This district or this bill doesn't just allow for more bargaining, it alters the balance of power. And I would say it incentivizes teachers unions to, to demand or to propose lower standards because they're, they're positioned perfectly. It allows them the strongest leverage point. That's a concern for my organization because Positioning unions in that way is going to lead to lower standards for teacher performance. And as I said at the beginning, that's going to have a negative effect on our expectations for students. My organization thinks expectations for low performers is among the most important thing. And then lastly, we're very concerned about the differential impact. So if everybody would be forced to pay higher costs in order to secure the standards and the criteria that they want, for their evaluation criteria. We're not quite sure how that cuts, but I'm concerned that districts serving large concentrations of low-income students may be least able to pay the higher costs that unions would likely seek. So for those reasons, we're opposed, and Senator Liu, as I said, hope we can work it out, but I have to be honest in our opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Madam Chair, members, Nancy Chaitis Espinosa with the California School Boards Association, also here respectfully in opposition. I, I observed it's interesting uh, hearing the author and the proponents talk about this bill, that we want so many of the same things. Um, unfortunately, my organization just doesn't see this bill being the vehicle to get us there. Uh, first and foremost, I think most of us here would agree that teachers are our most important resource, our most important asset. Um, and... Districts are held, held accountable for the progress of our students or lack thereof. Um, if LEAs, if school districts are not able to use all of their resources in line with meeting their goals for student achievement, um, that's a problem for us. And that's our primary concern with this bill. So by removing our ability to determine evaluation standards, this bill removes our ability to ensure that our most important resource is being used in line with our goals for student achievement. 
Um, secondly, I, I wanted to clarify some of the discussion. Evaluation is already based on multiple factors, um, and teachers are already a part of the process of determining evaluation procedures, as of course they should be. Um, but introducing the design or the selection, rather, of evaluation standards into the negotiation and collective bargaining environment is a fundamental change. Simply uh, think about it in these terms. We are going from developing uh, evaluation standards to negotiating them. That is a tremendous change. Um, this creates the opportunities, as my colleague said, for stakeholders to leverage important evaluation standards related to student, student achievement for gains related to salary or negotiation. Um, the expansion and the scope of collective bargaining will greatly increase the frequency of impasse and concerted action, such as strikes. Um, if we expect districts to align all of their activities and use all of their resources to ensure that their students are ready to uh, graduate and succeed in college and career, um, we must retain as LEAs control over the uh, evaluation standards and criteria of our educators. Uh, responsibility and authority should go hand in hand, so we respectfully ask for your no vote. Laura Preston, Association of California School Administrators. We're also, um, sadly, in opposition. Um, I want to thank the staff for both the Senate Ed Committee and the President Pro Tem's office for engaging us in some really good conversations. And I think conceptually we're in the same place. What we want for evaluations is to be able to use a mechanism where you're improving performance, whether it's for teachers or it's for administrators. Um, the problem is, as you've heard from my prior um, colleagues, is that this bill gets really into a place that is a disadvantage for us to really look at student achievement in the way we want to do um, to, to uh, achieve that. And we also want to make sure that the districts, we don't, we don't um, disagree that there has to be a conversation with our unions. We're, we're in this together. But we want to make sure it's a process that we can make, um, ensure that our students are learning, that we're able to improve uh, teaching and administrators. We need funding. Um, AXA is adamant, and I know that's not for this committee, but there has to be resources tied to the training of um, evaluators. We concur that um, evaluations throughout the state have been pretty inconsistent because there's nowhere for administrators administrators to be getting some consistent training. We're all for that, but we got to be careful that when we start talking about the details, we want it to be broad enough so that every evaluator is treated the same, that you know that there's certain concepts you're going you're gonna to get, but you got to not make it so rigid that it's impossible for to implement. And then finally, the um, teacher, excuse me, the administrator evaluation uh, piece in the bill was mirrored after legislation that Senator Liu and AXA worked on a few years ago and putting some best practices of what we saw for administrator evaluations into statute. The bill now codifies it, and it has additional requirements for administrators that are far beyond what they would be for the teachers. We don't negotiate. We're typically, unless you're a large, large school district, um, we are not unionized. And so we are going to be forced with what is in statute and have no way to be able to negotiate something differently. So those are the, um, some of the broader reasons why we're opposed today. Thank you. One more that's here at the table. Thank you. Brad Strong, Children Now, we support many of the provisions that the proponents also talk about. Um, but but um, I mean, I think it's the, the disagreements over the bill that aren't being discussed and look forward to that conversation. We are opposed to the bill. Um, Children Now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a, quite a line. Are there more support? No. Opposition. Opposition. Good afternoon. Okay, Patty. there is a line there. Can I ask you to uh, limit it to like less than a minute? Sure. If uh, you're going to speak or you can just say oppose or um, if you'd like to do that. Do you want to start? Thank you. Good afternoon. Patty Herrera representing Riverside County Schools. For the reasons, the concerns articulated over the um, expansion of the scope of bargaining, um, we, we, we also have an opposed to the bill. We are also concerned about the decoupling of um, student achievement standards to uh, evaluation systems that we articulated in our letter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mira Morton here on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, also in opposition for the reasons already stated. Thank you. You were very short. Bill Lucia with that voice. Uh, we've provided detail letter with our concerns and opposition. We appreciate the staff's listening, but we, we still have some very strong bright line concerns in opposition. Thank you. Good morning. Brett Barley, Students First, also in opposition for the reasons detailed in our letter. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 
Uh, Jeff Frost, California Association of Suburban School Districts and the Orange County Department of Education in opposition. Thank you. Kim Lewis, representing families and schools and unfortunately opposed to the bill for the letter, the reasons stated in our letter as well. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Morales, representing the County Superintendents Association in opposition to this bill. Thank you. Hi, Hannah Lincoln Hooker on behalf of Students Matter. Um, We've been working with your staff on, you know, we'd like to move to support position. We currently oppose, um, and we're hoping for a quick exception. We have um, LAUSD Teacher of the Year, Kat Chuko, up, um, and she has a, a personal story and a position on the bill that she'd like to share, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, legislators. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here to advocate on behalf of my students. And I agree with so many of the statements made in this bill, and I think it's really going to benefit teachers and students. I commend you, Senator Liu, for putting forward a bill that has multiple measures, um, multiple observations, and allows the use of student data. That's so important. Also, getting rid of that antiquated STOL Act and evaluating teachers on a continuum always helps us to be able to try to move into that more effective or most effective bracket. Um, and, you know, we'd really like to see, in order for this to fit with the recommendations set forth under the Vergara ruling, in order to provide high-quality access to instruction for all our students, regardless of the neighborhood they live in and um, their socioeconomic status, that the clauses that still remain in the bill that can grandfather in exceptions for bargaining at the local level between districts and unions be removed so that all students have access to this tremendous evaluation system that you're proposing, and we make sure that there are no exceptions in any schools in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any uh, senators like to um, make a comment? Yes. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Liu, for bringing this uh, bill forward. I think it is much needed, and I think it goes a long way in, in resolving a lot of issues. I just wanted to address a couple of comments that gentleman who made them, he may, may still be in the room, he may not be. When, you know, I think it's always interesting that whenever there's something that, the, you know, the opposition doesn't like, the first thing we're going to throw out there is that costly retiree health care and higher wages. <laughs> well, God forbid that we want someone to put in 30, 35, 40 years of their life working to better our students and the future for all of us, and then we don't want to pay them retiree health care. Um, that's just absurd. I do know very well that retiree health care is extremely expensive. I spent many years of my life negotiating those benefits. So we can find a way to make that, that better. And higher wages. God forbid our teachers can actually pay their bills and come to school and educate uh, the future and not be worried about paying their bills. And I think it's just absurd to say that teacher unions would propose lower standards. Does anyone really think that the teachers union wants teachers to fail, that they want teachers to not do a good job? If our teachers don't do a good job and they're not successful, our children aren't successful. So I just wanted to make those points. And to the school administrator who said they're not union, someone might be able to help you out with that if you feel like you need to be represented. <laughs> so thank you very much, Senator Liu, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Liu, thank you for bringing this bill forward. As a former classroom teacher, I dealt with this bill before, and it's an interesting process, but it doesn't, it's very antiquated. It needs to be updated. I appreciate the, our, my colleagues' uh, comments. As far as I don't see how it being bargained can lead to lower standards, I just, that kind of threw me away there. I was like, wow. And also, there was mentioned that the, the districts are held accountable for the progress of their students. I mean, we're all are held accountable. We're held accountable. Our, uh, we as teachers are held accountable. So I, I just think it's, it's, not, it's not a fair statement. But uh, I, in the classroom uh, for those full-time 10 years, I'd seen firsthand uh, how the stall process works, um, being stalled myself. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a process that really needs to be updated. It doesn't take many things into account. Uh, I really... It didn't really focus in on the overall picture of what teachers do day in and day out. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's, it's very necessary, but I don't want to, I think this bill needs to pro move out of this committee, continue the process, and, and continue the input, both of the opponents uh, as well as the proponents, and, and hopefully it will come to a resolution where we could all be happy 
but it should it, at least it starts here. At least the discussion gets to happen here. The stall process was enacted back in 1971, which is an amazing, amazing year, by the way. I really like that year. Uh, yeah, I enjoy, I really love that year. But uh, besides that it's my favorite year, I do think that the stall process needs to be updated. So thank, thank you so you. much for your hard thank work. You. Uh, thank and you, I, And I move the bill. Oh, one more. Yeah, I, I um, just wanted to uh, ask a question. Did you say that the, although the contracts will be bargained mm -hmm. locally, that the elements in the bargaining system cannot be bargained away? Yes. Yeah. There are certain, there are basic bottom line um, issues in an evaluation system that we have identified, just like the LCAP plan, you know, the eight, those, those eight elements, those, those things cannot, those, that's the floor, okay? That's, those things cannot be bargained out of the, um, out of a negotiated uh, settlement. Yeah. So you could only raise, raise the bar. Yeah, I, I, to me, that's um, a very interesting and important thing and should uh, soothe the concerns, I, I would think, of some of the opposition. I just wanted to also thank Senator Liu and all the people who came to the table to get us this far. And I uh, want to underscore that um, on page 12 of the analysis, it talks about that we need to specify the intent of the legislature to provide adequate resources to train evaluators, have robust teacher induction programs. I think that is critical. We lose almost half our beginning teachers um, because of the fact that they counsel themselves out in a few years because they work so hard in such difficult circumstances and often don't get the support and coaching that um, we give every football team from high school on. <laughs> and we ought to really realize the importance of our teachers. Um, and then um, also to support struggling educators. And I would say, um, echoing the words of the man I worked for during the 1990s, Secretary of Education Dick Riley, you want to hold them accountable as professionals, treat them as professionals, and pay them as professionals because they are, and they do some of the most difficult and demanding <coughs> and um, creative work in our society. But thank you for getting us this far, and we'll continue to work on the bill. I'll certainly support it today. Thank you very much. So just let me, just let me, just in closing, um, uh, or unless there's other questions from members. I just, you know, evaluation is very difficult, but I do know that uh, to be effective and to create, a, trying to create a system that honors the work of teachers, it's, it, it is very difficult. And I, you know, so we're trying to create a system that rewards or continuously improves the craft of teaching. And, um, uh, and we find that the bargaining issue is very difficult for some folks uh, who are opposed to the bill. But there has to be buy-in from teachers. And, um, you know, for us to see this, the buy-in is for them to be at the table to discuss what it is that, um, uh, that they feel that they can reach and goals that they can seek together. So we find that their voice needs to be heard and heard loudly. And um, school districts, which have strong teacher evaluation systems like Long Beach, which some of us uh, have visited before, uh, San Juan Unified and San Jose, these systems have been bargained hard at the table. And uh, we, we know that um, we, through the experience that they have had, that we know that through their collective bargaining process, they have resulted in um, effective induction programs and professional development programs and things that we want to see our teachers grow. So with that, you know, this is a conversation that um, has started, has been going on for a while, but has a long way to go. And I hope that um, the committee sees fit to uh, endorse the uh, concept that we need to move and, and improve um, our teachers' 
ability to perform their task in the classrooms today. So I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Senator Liu. The motion, okay, Senator. Okay, do pass as amended to appropriations, Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Hancock? Hancock, aye. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Monning? Pan? Vidak? No. Vidak, no. That's 4-2. Or two, and the last bill of the afternoon is item seven, Senator Mendoza, SB 329. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senators, I'm here to present SB 329. First, I will begin by accepting the amendments on page four of the analysis to remove the provisions that allow a school district and county office of education to deny a charter petition when the charter school would have a negative fiscal impact on the school district. SB 329 establishes public accountability and transparency standards for charter schools by tightening conflict of interest policies, adding assessments to ensure that school districts, school district staff has the capacity to conduct oversight, requiring an assessment of anticipated financial and education impacts on nearby public schools to be considered. Charter schools throughout the state of California provide an alternate, an alternative to standard public education for many students. Although charter schools contribute to our state, state's public education, there must still be oversight to ensure that children are receiving the best possible education. Unfortunately, we have seen cases in which uh, the, there have been small school districts with only 30 students in the district authorizing charter schools that enrolls up to 3,000. This means that the staff levels this means that staff levels appropriate to oversee 30 students are reasonable for conducting oversight for a, for a school that serves 100 times its size. It's really unreasonable. SB 329 requires school districts to consider whether school district staff has a capacity to, to conduct proper oversight of a charter school that, may, that they authorize. Additionally, this bill will bring transparency to public education and guard against any conflict of interest, establishing that charter schools are subject to the same regulations and competitive bidding as traditional public schools. Although, the charter, although charter schools offer an alternative edu uh, education option to meet the needs of our children across the state, it is critical that they operate with the student's best interests in mind. This bill seeks to bring accountability and transparency to these institutions. Uh, we have witnesses in support, Madam Chair. Please. Madam Chair and Senator Seth Bramble here on behalf of the California Teachers Association, proud to co-sponsor this important legislation. I'm just going to talk about two uh, pieces of the bill, um, one about the capacity of an authorizer to do effective oversight and another about the impact on neighborhood schools. We have been having conversations with, uh, with the administrators, with school boards, with the Charter Schools Association, with classified school staff. Uh, to bring forward um, the best policy. And I know that this committee last week considered a bill by Senator Pavley, which was about a very small uh, authorizer that placed a charter school outside of its uh, school district. Right. And what I want to clarify is that that wasn't an isolated incident, that there are several tiny districts throughout the state where uh, they're authorizing uh, charter schools where they don't have either the um, capacity to do that kind of oversight um, and so I know that uh, my colleague from California Virtual Academy is going to talk some about their structure and some similar things that we've seen in different areas with authorizers or, across the state. But the questions we were proposing to stakeholders is number one, like what are the, let's, let's better define what exactly are your responsibilities and obligations uh, with respect to oversight. And number two, what do you need to have in place to carry out those uh, duties? And so what this bill suggests is that when you're considering what kind of support you have from parents, from teachers, to establish a new charter school based on the petition, that you also consider a report about your capacity, which hopefully will be useful in determining what staff you have in place to do that important oversight work. Do you need to build new structures? Do you need to have new staff, et cetera? Um, we were pleased to see that in the opposition letter from the Charter Schools Association that it appeared they agreed on that point that it would be useful for a school district to assess how it will conduct oversight. 
Uh, additionally, this bill uh, suggests that when a new charter petition comes forward, we also consider what the uh, impact is going to be on other school districts, sorry, other uh, schools where the district has oversight capacity. In most cases, charter schools are authorized by a school district, although we recognize some could be authorized by a county office, some by the state board. Uh, the idea is that the authorizer takes a look at their charter schools, takes a look at their traditional public schools in efforts to provide better coordination, uh, and develops a plan for all the schools uh, that they're responsible for oversight, looking at things like the geographic distribution of schools, projected demographic changes, and that new charter petitions that come forward are evaluated in respect to how they impact that plan. Um, what we have seen uh, from voters is that before any uh, charter schools approve, voters would love us to conduct an analysis of the impact that the school will have on neighborhood public schools. The public doesn't want their great neighborhood public school harmed by decisions that are made by their elected officials. In the polling data, we see basically it's that school down the street, two blocks down where I send my kids, has a great performing arts program, has a wonderful library, has a science lab. Whatever you're doing as a district, don't impact this great neighborhood school. So what is this bill about? This bill is about what all Californians want, which is a great school in every neighborhood. We urge your I vote. Thank you. Others in support? Yes, Madam Chair. Senator Mendoza, happy birthday. Uh, my name is Thank Jen you. Shilin. I am a history <laughs> teacher at California Virtual Academies, a large online charter school with about 700 teachers and over 15,000 students across the state via 11 charter school petitions with 11 charter governing boards. It's a complicated structure, very different from my past teaching assignment at the Elk Grove Unified School District. As COVID teachers, 80 to 90% of our work week is consumed with paperwork, leaving us with just a few hours per week for instructional time with our students. The clerical duties we are given prevent teachers from teaching and prevent students from learning. At this point, you are asking why. Why is CAVA not hiring clerical staff? That is what the representative from the California Charter Schools Association asked last week on a hearing for a different bill. Why aren't teachers given time to teach? Why does CAVA keep students on the attendance roll sheets that only go online for one minute a day? It has everything to do with profit. It has everything to do with lack of oversight. And it has everything to do with Senate Bill 329. Firstly, profit. One of CAVA's main purposes is to provide revenue for its manager and primary vendor, K-12 Incorporated, a publicly traded company. Not only is this for-profit corporation the manager of each CAVA board's school funds, but the company pays itself for services out of CAVA bank accounts that it is authorized to manage. That is not how this is supposed to work. Last year, CAVA teachers voted to unionize because we know we can do better to improve educational outcomes for our students. And we believe that as teachers, we have a responsibility to transform CAVA into a place where kids can thrive. Understand, please, that I work at a public school where the agreements of the 11 charter petitions limit competitive bidding. The CAVA locations are prohibited from seeking another vendor for services K-12 Incorporated is able to provide. The agendas for these governing board meetings are identical across locations and are provided to the boards of each location by CAVA's head of schools, who is a K-12 Incorporated employee. I have only been at CAVA less than three years, but the more I look at the structure, the more systematic problems I see. Senate Bill 329 will require competitive bidding. This will mean that the money that is currently being sent out of state to please shareholders and the money that pays for the lead administrator's $4 million annual salary will instead be dedicated to the classrooms here in California. I never imagined I would work for such a place and now I am working to transform it. No matter which metric you use, CAVA is not performing well academically, despite having a smaller population than the rest of California of English learners and socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Of course, when teachers are not allowed to teach and money goes to maximize enrollment and advertising, it is clear why students struggle. In every year except 2013, CAVA had more dropouts than graduates. In the last three years for which data is available from 2011, 2010-2011 uh, through 2012-2013, 
Cava's overall graduation rate was 36%. That's compared with the same time period, the state of California's graduation rate was 78. As I explained, Cava exists in California through 11 charter petitions and 11 authorizers. Let's take a closer look at a couple of those authorizers. Cava likes to use tiny rural school districts for authorizers. These districts have limited capacity and motivation to do effective oversight. Cava at San Diego serves over 3,000 students and is authorized by Spencer Valley Elementary School District, which has a core population of 30 students. Cava San Joaquin serves 1,596 students and is authorized by New Jerusalem Elementary School District, which has a core population of just 23 students. Additionally, New Jerusalem School District authorizes several other charter schools that together serve another almost 2,000 students. So I want to uh, respond to the gentleman from the Charter School Association who asked last week why the authorizer is not holding Cava accountable. The school district does not have the ability to hold Kava accountable. To force Kava to spend money on kids and classrooms, um, SB 329 will provide this motivation for these authorizers to look within, to do some soul searching, to see if they have people in place to do the oversight that they're required to do by law, and to ensure that the charter petition is being followed, to make sure there are clerical staff in place so that teachers have time to teach. Thank you for hearing our story. Thank you. Hi, and I'm Mark Holtzbeck. I'm a special education teacher teaching high school to California virtual academies. I teach uh, mostly Northern California, but I teach the, my students come on statewide. I want to thank uh, Senator Mendoza for coming forward with this bill that addresses the need for charter school oversight. I think we've had, had a lot of discussions about the fact that there are good ch charter schools and there are bad charter schools. As as a special education teacher, I was I was concerned when I saw some of the ways that Kava was handling their special education students, and so I've joined in our efforts to reform our school. We have gone forward to the authorizers and to our to our um, to our administrators at our school and to our authorizers in an effort to address these these concerns, and we have not been able to get any action on these. the The authorizers pretty much have not been have not done anything that there is, even though we were able to express a lot of our concerns. So, I urge you to vote yes on this uh, to an I vote and to move this uh, needed legislation forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Others in support. Uh, Madam Chair, members, Nancy Chaitis Espinosa with the California School Boards Association. Uh, as you know, current law does not allow uh, a local educational agency to deny a charter petition, even if that uh, school board or county office knows that doing so would result in uh, negative certification, or if they know they simply don't have that capacity to provide the necessary oversight. Um, this bill would provide that ability, which we think is very important. Um, and in uh, some areas where there are de where there's declining enrollment, or we have small or rural school districts, for example, this is a particularly important issue. So we respectfully ask for your support for this measure. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Others in support of the bill, please come forward or or stand at the microphone. Jeff Johnston. I'm a teacher in Lodi Unified School District, and I rise in support of SB 329 um, because it does put in place. Uh, an accountability measure for uh, authorizing agencies to exercise fiduciary responsibility. Thank you. Peter Manette, classroom teacher from Nevada County, Penn Valley School District. We've also had small um, local districts chartering schools even outside of our county. We still have a situation where a, a local school district, small district, has a charter outside of the county and basically calls a substantial amount of income from the 2% overhead that they're allowed to charge. Thank you. If it's not obvious, I speak in favor of 329. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Aaron Evans, on behalf of the School Employers Association of California, I am in support of, we are in support of the bill, and I would just like to echo the comments that have made, been already made by my colleague at the School Boards Association. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, any others in support? Anyone opposed to the bill? Please come forward and fill up these chairs. Thank you.
Madam Chair and members, Rand Martin on behalf of the California Charter Schools Association. Um, really appreciate the work of the committee and, and certainly the author in agreeing to take out the negative fiscal impact portion of the bill. Um, that was uh, the biggest part of the bill that we objected to, but we are still very concerned about the, the bidding practices piece. I do want to point out that as, uh, as Mr. Bramble uh, indicated, we did think the, do think the idea of the school district doing some analysis on their capacity to do oversight is really helpful, um, and we think that they should be doing that. Not as a reason to reject the charter, but so they can prepare themselves to do the right thing when the charter is authorized and they, they make sure that they put the right resources into it. Um, I do want to uh, uh, comment on one of the comments that the, one of the CAVA rep uh, representatives made about, uh, about um, the oversight of, this, of, the, um, of the charter schools from tiny school districts. For those who may not be aware, charter schools have to pay anywhere from 1% to 3% of their revenue to the oversight district. So a very tiny school district that's authorizing a school that has 3,000 students in San Diego um, is bringing in $300,000 from the um, charter school. I think that's enough money to pay for sufficient resources to be doing aggressive oversight. Um, I, I think, Mr. Madam Chair, in, our, in your comments on SB 322 earlier today, really hit the nail on the head relative to that bill and this bill. So the problem is really about oversight. And as you've instructed us, and I've taken it back to CCSA, let's see if we can come up some, with some ideas to strengthen oversight. But clearly, resources is not a problem. We're paying a lot of money to school districts to make sure that we're doing, um, doing our job. Um, on the issue of, uh, of bidding practices, again, as we've talked about in, in other bills, we, we'd like to know what the problem is. We understand why the proponents are motivated to do this. We've heard the testimony from CAVA here and elsewhere, the CAVA teachers uh, here and elsewhere, that they have an interest in their relationship with, uh, with K-12 that operates their schools. But there's 1,184 charter schools, and why we're changing the law relative to bidding practices when there may be a problem at one of those schools, or 11 of those schools, depending on how you count it, um, again, doesn't, doesn't make sense to us. Um, there's a, a lot of onerous and burdensome stuff in the bidding practices law. I used to represent school districts, and school districts also hate this law um, and would like to see it uh, uh, eased in, in, in many ways. So why we extend that to charter schools that are in less of a position to be able to do that um, does not make sense to us. If there is a specific problem, let's deal with a specific problem, but let's please not uh, make a blanket change to the statute simply because somebody is having a dispute within one charter school. Thank you. Thank you. Others in opposition? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ana Ponce. I come from Camino Nuevo Charter Academy in Los Angeles, and I'm here today to ask you I'm to... Sorry. The people who are talking in favor of this do not clearly state the name of the Charter Academy. Oh, if you wouldn't mind okay. another... Sure, story. of course. Camino Nuevo Charter Academy in Los Angeles. Camino Nuevo. It's Spanish, yeah. I know, it's, I know it's Spanish, and I understand Spanish. Blah, blah, blah. When it all runs together, it's a little hard. <laughs> okay. okay. So let me, let me get a little closer here. <laughs> so Ana Ponce from Camino Nuevo Charter Academy in Los Angeles, and I'm here to ask you to oppose SB 329. Um, this bill will uh, re-regulate charter schools and make them subject to competitive bidding practices without a justified cost. Uh, Camino Nuevo was founded in 2000, and our approach to education is comprehensive. We take students from pre-K through high school and prepare them for success in college and in life. We uh, are a very inclusive community that brings in the families and does a lot of work with the communities to ensure the success of our students. We serve primarily English language learners, and most of our students, over 95%, qualify for free and reduced lunch. So I think um, we're definitely serving some of the populations that are allegedly, allegedly not served by charter schools. Um, I appreciate the, the, that the committee recommends and that Senator Mendoza has agreed to remove the most har harmful provision in the bill, which would allow school districts and county boards of education to deny charters if there is a negative fiscal impact. This would have allowed school districts to put their bottom line above the needs of students and parents at a time when we have over 100,000 students on charter school waiting lists across the, the state. 
However, the fact remains that SB 329 continues to seek to re-regulate charter schools. Under the bill, charter schools would be subject to the competitive bidding practices used by school districts and thus takes away their flexibility and ability to select products and vendors that are the best fit for the <coughs> charter school. Charter school authorizers already review charter schools' finances. We submit regular reports, required reports. We submit our annual budget, our um, uh, unaudited financials, as well as our audits. And we're also uh, required to have fiscal policies as part of our fiscal management, and the authorizers approve those um, practices. If a school district or a county board of education believes that a charter school is misusing funds, they do have the right to investigate and to uh, request a different action. And if charter schools don't comply, the authorizer can revoke the charter. And so we already have processes in place, we already have expectations, and um, I, I think that you know charter schools and authorizers are trying to uh, definitely follow the law and to take one example and to impose it on every charter school, I don't think is um, a fair practice. Uh, in addition to the fact that authorizers can currently review charter schools purchasing and finances overall, the provision takes away the charter school's autonomy and will slow down their purchasing pro processes, which can directly impact meeting the needs of kids in a timely manner. Um, for these reasons, SB 329 is un unnecessary, and I ask you to oppose it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Quickly, please, uh, others in, uh, opposed to the bill, come forward to the microphone. Um. Rod Barley, students first in opposition. Thank you. Dr. Henry Moisley, Green Dot Public Schools, um, opposed. Thank you. Susan Lang, parent at Golden Valley Charter School, opposed. Thank you. Allison Jokovitska, parent at Golden Valley Charter School, I'm also opposed. Joanna Hola, parent at Golden Valley Charter School, in opposition to this bill. Jody Graff, director of Ed Visions and Education in Sacramento, opposed. Mary, excuse me, Mary Welch, Area Superintendent for Aspire Public Schools, also opposed. Chris Meheran, Director, CORE Charter School, Camptonville Academy. And uh, we have an aerospace program, some students presenting at Aviation Day, and you're welcome to hear about what they're learning. Hi, Ruth Dutton, um, Principal Superintendent of Sycamore Valley Academy in Visalia, California. Um, I wanted to just reiterate what others have said, that this seems to be one, a one-size-fits-all approach to, um, sounds like, a potential problem in one place. I respectfully urge the committee to vote no on SB 329 as it will hamper charter school administrators' ability to efficiently operate their schools. Having just come through the process of developing a school and opening it in its uh, third academic year, I know about the launch of a charter school. I simply cannot imagine that already arduous process with the added requirement of a competitive bidding um, process complicating the launch and ongoing operations of the charter. Thank you for your time. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Yolanda López. Uh, why you don't support, do not support SB 329? Why don't listen to the fathers? Why don't give me a better school? Why stop charter school? When my child go to the school, public school, in the kindergarten, three child try to kill my son. And the district school not listen to me. Nobody listen to me. And I found a better school. My son is secure. And Mr. Senator Mendoza, you work for the fathers, right? No versus father. ¿Por qué trabajas? ¿Por qué trabajas? Tú trabajas para los padres, ¿verdad? Ok. ¿Por qué no apoyas a los padres? No, porque nos quieres, dar, nos quieres parar a las escuelas charter. Voy a aclarar aquí. Mi nombre es Eva Oviedo. Soy mamá de dos niños de la escuela Caliber de Richmond, una escuela charter. Mi niño tuvo dos años en una escuela del distrito y nunca recibió el apoyo que, yo necesita, que él necesitaba. Fui al distrito, hablé con los maestros, con la directora y nunca recibí ayuda. Y es por eso que estoy en contra de la ley SB 329. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Norma Pérez. Uh, yo estoy hoy 
en contra de la ley SB 329. Mi hija ha estado en una escuela del distrito. Esa escuela estuvo por cinco años en título 1. Nunca le dieron atención. Eh, es la importancia que tiene un niño para ustedes. Eh, en esta escuela charter ha encontrado eso y más. Por eso queremos que nuestra escuela charter siga, que nos den... Eh, para construir un lugar y todo, ¿verdad? Que usted nos apoye con eso, señor Mendoza. Okay, okay. please uh, just come to the microphone, introduce yourself, and tell me whether or not you are opposed to the bill. Hola, mi nombre es Elena Oregón y yo vengo a, a ponerme en contra de la SB 329. Gracias. Hola, mi nombre es Dalia García y yo soy orgullosamente una mamá de Caliber, una escuela charter. Yo estoy en contra de la ley SB 329. Hello, my name is Ofelia Alonso. I'm a parent from Caliber Beta Academy, and I urge you to please oppose SB 329. Thank you. David McCreary, excuse me, David McCreary. I'm an instructor at the Core Academy Camptonville. We are currently on the North Lawn with our advanced model aeronautics class that is only available through Core Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Hi, my name is Julie Bautista. Um, again, I'm a senior from Kip San Jose Collegiate, and I oppose SB 329. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julissa Barron, and I'm a senior at Kip San Jose Collegiate, and I oppose SB 329. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Lee from Kip Bay Area Schools, and I oppose SB 329. Thank you. Hola, mi nombre es Leticia Contreras. Yo tengo dos hijos en um, dos escuelas charter diferentes y me opongo a la SB 329. Hola, mi nombre es Mireya. Yo tengo cuatro niñas en la charter school de Richmond y me opongo a la SB 329. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Martinez. I came for Caliber Better School Richmond and I oppose to the SB 329. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susana Landeros. I, am, I came from Richmond, and I oppose to 329. I have a child in a, a charter school in Caliber. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lucero Vega. I'm the mother of two children of Richmond, and I'm opposed to 329. Thank you. Paul Kiefer, Pacific Charter Institute, and uh, we oppose uh, SB 329. Thank you. Mi nombre es Blanca Calderón y estoy en contra de la ley 329. Thank you. Mi nombre es María Ledesma y tengo tres hijos en la escuela charter y me opongo a esta ley. My name is Eduardo Ledesma from Hercules, California. I have a student at uh, uh, Caliber Beta Academy in Richmond, also opposed. Madam Chair and members, Brendan Tuig on behalf of Ed Voice in opposition. My name is Montserrat, and I go to a school in a uh, charter school in Richmond, and I oppose this bill. Hello, my name is Tiffany Acevedo, and I oppose this bill. And I go to a charter school in Richmond. Thank you. My name is Jocelyn Mendoza. I go to charter school in Richmond, and I oppose to SB 329. My name is Samantha Rodriguez, and I oppose SB 329. Thank you. My name is Dolly Gomez, and I oppose to SB 329. Thank you. My name is Lauren O'Neill, the Executive Director of Odyssey Charter School in the Pasadena area. Opposed. My name is David Calderon. I'm from Richmond, California. My son goes to Caliber in Richmond Charter School in Richmond, California. From 8 to 6, he couldn't be in a better happy place. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any others in uh, opposition to the bill? Questions from members? I think we're all exhausted. Um, The bill has been moved. Would you like to close, Senator uh, Mendoza? Yeah, Madam Chair. I know there was some discussion in the back. Some of the um, some of the parents came forward saying that uh, why do I want to close their schools? And right. I, which I don't want to close their schools. I just want to do three things. I want to create more transparency. I want to make sure that the school district that's authorizing has the capacity to oversee this district that they're these charters that they're creating, and I want to. Also make sure that there's a, an assessment of the anticipated financial and educational impacts to nearby schools when they are created. So that's all we're doing. We're not shutting down charter schools. Uh, we're just making sure that we're creating more safeguards for our students and the folks that work at these charters. So with that, I respectfully ask for your high vote. Thank you. 
Is the bill moved? The bill has been moved. Um, please call the roll. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Block I, Hancock? Aye. Hancock I, Leva? Aye. Leva I, Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza I, Monning? Aye. Monning I, Pan? Aye. Pan I, Vidak? No. Vidak, no. Okay. 7-2. Seven, 7-2, seven, the bill is out. I think we're all here. Thank you, members. Um, let's go through the roll uh, for one last time and um, close this session out. Seven sevens out. Is it out? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's what go is to number three. Item three, SB 131, Canella. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair voting aye. Leva? Aye. Leva aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza aye. Pan? Aye. Pan aye. It's 9 zero. 9 zero. The bill is out. Okay. And then item number five. Item five, SB 320, Laura. Do pass to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair aye. Block. Aye. Block aye. Leva. Aye. Leva aye. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza aye. Pan. Aye. Pan aye. Vidak. Aye. Vidak aye. Nine zero. Nine zero. The bill is out. Item six. SB three twenty two. Leno. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair no. Block. Aye. Block aye. Leva. Aye. Leva aye. Mendoza. Mendoza, aye. Pan? Aye. Pan, aye. Vidak? No. Vidak, no. Oh, that's 7-2. Seven, 7-2, two. Seven, two, the bill is out. Item 7, I think everybody just voted on it, correct? That's out. <clears throat> that's out. Item 8, SB 376, Laura? Do pass to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair, no. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Pan? Aye. Pan, aye. That's 7-2. Seven, 7-2, two. Seven, two, the bill is out. Item 10, SB 451, Laura. Do pass as amended. Uh, chair voting aye, vice chair no. Block, aye. block aye. Mendoza, aye. Mendoza aye. Pan, aye. Pan aye. That's 8-1. Eight, 8-1, one. Eight, one, that bill is out. Item 11, SB 460, Allen. Do pass to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair aye. Block. Aye. Block aye. Leva. Aye. Leva aye. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza aye. Pan. Aye. Pan aye. Vidak. Aye. Vidak aye. Nine zero. Nine zero. That bill is out. Item 12, SB 499, Lou. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair no. Block. Aye. Block aye. Monning. Aye. Monning aye. Pan. Aye. Pan aye. 7-2. Seven, 7-2, two. Seven, two, that bill is out. Item 13, SB 548, De Leon. Do pass to Labor and Industrial Relations. Lou? Aye. Lou? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Lou, aye. Runner? No, sorry. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Pan? Aye. Pan, aye. Vidak? No. Vidak, no. 7-2. Seven, 7-2, two. Seven, two, that bill is out. Item 14, SB 605, Gaines. Do pass as amended to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair aye. Block. Aye. Block aye. Leva. Aye. Leva aye. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza aye. Pan. Aye. Pan aye. 9-0. Nine, 9-0, zero. Nine, zero, that bill is out. So we have five bills on consent. Um, it's not item 2, SB 123, item 4, SB 313, item 9, SB 410, item 16, SB 708, and item uh, 17, SB 725. Call the absent members, and please. that consent is out. And consent is out. Okay. Oh, it's all done? Yes. All right. So we'll see you next week for more fun and games. <laughs> Thank you, members. Oh,